review and thoughts of 1994's True Lies. That's True Lies, not Trulies, which is how you know that your bartender is not going to be very much help with your questions about lightsabers. So, I'm going to start by telling you this is a movie that I certainly enjoy aspects of, and I wish I loved it, but holy crap, is there a lot of really messed up stuff in this. So, yeah. I'm going to be talking about a lot of that, so yeah, um, it's going to be one of those videos. I will make a few jokes, and if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. As soon as I'm the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. I will probably be talking fast because my back is still pretty bad. This movie is rated R and it yeah it features some language so this video might also feature some not a huge amount but moderate to strong language and the, let's see and if you want to know the details of why the MPA gave it an R I'm not going to be talking about that, at least not in the, not before I get into spoilers. So, yeah, if you want to know, there are details on IMDb in the Parents Guide. I have watched this, this is at least my third viewing. I, I think it is just three viewings, so yeah. And the first time I watched it, I guess, was around the year 2000, if I had to... I don't know with 100% certainty, but that would be my guess. And, yeah, so, the plot. I'm going to be quoting some of IMDb's summary here. A fearless, globe-trotting, terrorist-battling secret agent has his life turned upside down when he discovers something about his wife while terrorists pose a significant threat. And... So, let's see. Yeah, so, I try these days to not review things that I don't really love, but James Cameron has not made that huge amount of movies, and the vast majority... Yeah, this is probably the only James Cameron movie I don't love. All of the others, yes, including Titanic, sue me. I did a video... Uh, a couple of weeks ago by now, I guess, was it last week, where I talk about why I love that movie. And, yeah, so the... Let's see... Right, um, since this is R-rated, you know, I watched it on Disney+. Plus. I'm not sure I saw anyone say it about this in particular, but I've seen people bring it up for other movies that are on Disney Plus that are not for children, not and not for teenagers and such. You can put this behind, you know, there's there's a password protected age lock function on Disney Plus. If you are sharing a, um, what's it called? Sharing an account with, you know kids or teenagers and you don't want them watching this which I I agree you children should not be watching this movie so let's get into the writing so this was written by James Cameron if you go to IMDB Claude ZD and Simon Michael are also listed as writers but in actuality that's because this is a remake of a movie that they did write called La Totale and he did apparently try to write it with other people because this was, you know, he, he doesn't usually do comedies, but he ended up just getting rid of them and writing all the comedy himself, 
which I think explains some things. So, yes, I have not watched the show that is currently airing. That's, like, I don't think it's a sequel to this. I think it is basically, like, maybe not a remake, but a reboot. And I, I would like to. I do not currently have access to it. I agree with everything Lindsay Ellis said in her video on it. We'll try not to restate what she expresses very well, and we'll link the video in the description box. So, worst to best ranking of the movies that James Cameron has written, but not directed. And, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, worst to best, Dark Fate, Rambo 2, Alita, and Strange Days. And... Honestly, I love aspects of all four of those movies, and it's been a while since I watched Strange Days, but I, Strange Days, I remember it being excellent. And, uh, let's see... Right, so I realize the following are less action comedies, more satires that have action scenes, but I love Team America, which is much more self-aware about the ridiculous racist stereotypes. You know, that movie is essentially making fun of racist Americans. Like, white Americans, like, this is, be honest, this is how you see Middle Easterners. You know, their, their language is nonsense, they all look really f foreign and other. You know, that movie is making fun of Americans, this movie is making fun of Middle Easterners. And, of course, Starship Troopers, again, more, less an action comedy, more a satire with action scenes, but yeah. I do think you can co combine comedy with other genres. You know, I think that Ready or Not, The Menu, Barbarian Fresh, and Jennifer's Body do a great job of combining horror, at least horror elements, not all of those are, you know, entirely horror movies, with comedy, and, you know, they... they work together, they feed each other rather than cannibalizing each other. And I think Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid blends comedy and tragedy really well. Yes, overall I do think this movie does a good job blending the genres. This there is a lot to laugh at and there the action is really good. Like if you watch comedies that have like actions, you know, there there are action scenes in What's it called? Um, Mel Brooks's Star Wars parody. What was it called again? I'm going to have it momentarily. Unless I accidentally close the link. Okay, so here. Here we go. It is, of course... can't believe I didn't... It's called Spaceballs. That's it. That movie does have some action scenes, but it's not really, like, exciting action so much. It's cool, don't get me wrong, I, I do think he did a good job on it, but it's not really like, ah, oh, we're into this action scene so much as it is, you know, here's a funny action scene, basically, where in this movie, you know, there's, there's never, like, a huge chunk of this that just has no jokes. There are chunks of the movie that don't have a lot of action, but then they have, like, suspense and tension instead. And, you know, I, I'm not 100% certain that I picked it up in the movie itself, but Lindsay Ellis and at least one IMDb user review says that the terrorists in this are Palestinian. IMDb and Wikipedia don't specify... So, in case, you know, Lindsay Ellis, the IMDb user, reviewer, and me have, you know, gotten that wrong, the following is not relevant to this particular movie, but I do th still think that it's worth saying, even if I have, you know, there's, there's not enough empathy for... Palestinians in American media. So, let's see. Yes, so I copied some stuff in from Wikipedia. So, after failed attempts at state formation and the creation of Israel in the post-colonial era, a series of Marxist and anti-Western transformations and movements swept through the Arab and Islamic world. Those These movements were nationalist and revolutionary, not Islamic. So, Islamic. So, it is highly... 
back to me. So it is highly inaccurate to have the movie focus so much on the religious aspect, and it's hard to believe that this choice was made for any other reason than xenophobia. You know, there's um, American media has very little empathy for Muslims, where like, yeah, if if you just had it be, oh, you know, they're looking for, you know, for for sure, like there's a lot of hostility towards communism and such in in western media but they don't hate it the way they hate muslims and yeah like you could have if you just wanted to oh you know let's yeah uh communist terrorists they would probably have been russian you know ex soviet something you know that like what, what was it again neo neo soviet like you know uh, air force 1 which came out like three years after this movie, so the, the ending of the Cold War did not stop American movies from demonizing communism. Back to Wikipedia, but their view that terrorism could be effective in reaching their political goals generated the first phase of modern international terrorism, so that aspect does have some accuracy. In the late 1960s, Palestinian secular movements such as Afata and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, PFLP, began to target civilians outside the immediate arena of conflict, which is morally wrong, yes, but keep in mind Israel is far more murderous of Palestinians by orders of magnitude. And let's see. Um, I don't know how much more this is. Okay, yeah, I'll just, more from Wikipedia. Following Israel's 1967 defeat of Arab forces, Palestinian leaders began to see that the Arab world was unable to militarily confront Israel. During the same time, lessons drawn from revolutionary movement, movements in Latin America, North Africa, Southeast Asia, as well as during the Jewish struggle against Britain in Palestine, saw the Palestinians turn away from guerrilla warfare towards urban terrorism and honestly the the again if Lindsay Lindsay Ellis the one user review and myself are correct that the terrorists in this movie are Palestinians this might be my single biggest problem with the film Palestinians get way too little empathy by Americans and this very well may have helped make that worse of all the different Middle Eastern backgrounds to give the terrorists which keeping in mind didn't have to be Middle Eastern at all like in America way more terrorism is carried out by white conservative men than Middle Eastern people and if you wanted to make that funny like white conservative men are some of the most pathetic like, in, in all of history, the modern white conservative man is just a child in, a, in an adult's body screaming about perceived slights. Like, it's, you could so easily make a comedy just tearing into how pathetic they are. You know, honestly, there almost definitely are comedies that especially make fun of, like, conservative yeah I'll maybe I'll I'll think of at least one of these movies later in this video but you know so let's see and uh, yeah you know the, the terrorists in this movie did not even have to be motivated by religion this is not like a like the terrorists in this movie make it clear this is not about religion it's about like, it's basically revenge, you know, because of American state terrorism, you know, the th things that America has done, war crimes that uh, the American military are responsible for. So, you know, the, the, honestly, the fact that it is specifically Middle Easterners and they're like, they're practically not given a language. Like, the, they're, you know, I can imagine when they speak, what the the language they speak is legitimately arab but it's not it's almost never subtitled and there's actually there's a point where one of the white people in the movie is like Ugh, blah 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 look at them go you know so yeah they're they're it's almost impossible for the average western viewer to relate to them they're, the movie goes out of its way to make them foreign and other so let's see and 
yeah, you know, the, the movie is supposed to be a comedy. Why didn't they pick something funny that wasn't so hateful? Just make it something ridiculous, like South Park the movie. There you go. That movie really tears into maybe not so much the male conservative, but the white female conservative. You know, this thing of, can you believe that they are teaching our kids to swear? We should invade. Like, that's, it has, it, this was before we, we were talking about Karens, but that's major Karen energy. I would like to speak to the manager kind of thing, you know. Make it that, you know. The, the South Park movie came out five years after this. So it's not like, you know, a completely different era of, of filmmaking. In South Park the movie, America goes to war because Canada kills the Baldwins in, um, what's it called, in retaliation for America taking Canadian citizens prisoner and not, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, Canada attempts diplomacy first, but, you know, yeah. Canada has not been aggressive towards America in forever, and there isn't a stereotype of them being really hateful towards America. In, in fact, it's the opposite. Everybody in America thinks that Canadians are permanently excessively polite. You know, and if you don't want it to be the nation of Canada, just have it be Canadian anti-American terrorists. The idea of going to war over the deaths of some actors, only one of which is even particularly beloved, is much easier to laugh at because there isn't some big movement to kill American actors. Palestinians are being genocided by Israel. That's true today. It was true when this movie was made. I have no issue with Jews. It is Netanyahu and his ilk that I hold responsible, not because he's Jewish. I don't hate him more than I hate white, white genocidal rulers. Movies like this and the fact that so much of the reception was positive and doesn't even criticize the misogyny and racism are why we need positive representation. It's really messed up how high this is rated despite those things, while something like Ms. Marvel, which has positive representation of Muslims, including Muslim women, but also men, and it doesn't hate white men, Christians, women, etc., so you can't claim that it's just hatred from another angle, is rated very low by reactionary people who are upset that the Muslims in the MCU are no longer exclusively either victims or terrorists. I love the MCU, I have from the start, but that kind of racism has been a really big problem. And at this point in making notes, I realize sometimes when you criticize racism in media, you have people questioning why that kind of thing is a problem. Easy. It's because there are a number of Muslim immigrants in America who want nothing more than to just live a normal life, and they are victims of abuse, even hate crimes, some of them are even killed because of movies like this, and that goes for basically every disadvantaged group. You know, ethnic minorities, LGBTQ people, immigrants, yeah. And let's see, yeah, so so one, uh, I forget who, but, but I did see one critic say, part of the reason that you cannot do a comedy about terrorism today is that with the 24-hour news cycle, people have been exposed to a lot of coverage on the war, of the war on terror. And then goes on to point out, the movie didn't have to make comedy out of that. It could have gone the route of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, which, you know, I, I'm not saying everything about that movie is perfect, and there's definitely a very valid reading of that movie as basically like, you know, it's an abusive relationship, like it's it's wife beating and such, and that's really messed up. That I am not making any excuses for that. But at least it isn't also racist, you know. And let's see. Yeah, and according to Wikipedia, James Cameron responded to a backlash against the movie by Arab American groups over the terrorists in it by stating he was only looking for generic terrorists. I almost used Irish terrorists as the bad guys. And originally it was rogue IRA operatives, but this you know was dropped when information about the film Blown Away, also from 1994, leaked. Cameron did not want another 1994 film to echo his plans for True Lies. This makes it even worse. He really didn't see any difference. Like that's again like for sure. There's you know there was a while where the Irish were not really accepted in America. 
But by 1994, that wasn't really, honestly, there's, you know, there's a bunch of American media that actually, like, basically carries water for the IRA. So I can't help but wonder if that was also a, you know, there's stuff like JAG, burn notice, so, yeah. Although I suppose those were after, so it's possible that something changed in between. I'm, I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert. And let's see. Yeah, Cameron ultimately included an entry near the end credits which stated that none of the characters in this in his movie were meant to be representative of any real racial, religious, ethnic, or social groups. If Cameron if James Cameron puts in the in the either opening or end credits of one of his movies, you know, we would like to acknowledge, you know he fucked up. And he got caught. He didn't he maybe didn't think he would get caught. But, you know, that's his mea culpa. He did the same thing with the Terminator 1 when, like, you know, I'm not going to claim that everything said by the great late... I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I'll have it momentarily. Um, the... Harlan Ellison. The late great writer Harlan Ellison. I'm not going to claim that every single time that he went after someone else and was like I can't believe you did this maybe some of the time he was like okay dude calm down let's let's try to just take a deep breath let's try to but he was absolutely true he was 100% accurate that demon with a glass hand and soldier the two two of the episodes I, I'm not sure if it's the only ones but two episodes that Harlan Nelson wrote for the hour limits helped inspire the Terminator. It's like, I've, I've watched both episodes multiple times. It's ridiculous to, to look at those and not think that, like, Cameron, like, even if Cameron didn't watch them, it must have been, like, you know, cultural osmosis or something, because, like, it, there's so much in those two episodes that's, yeah. And, uh, right, so, yeah, back to Wikipedia. When the film was initially released, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee was one of several groups to hold a protest at Washington, D.C. theater. The groups attacked the film for its depiction of Middle Easterners as homicidal religious zealots. A demand for the boycott of the movie was called, as well as a ban of its distribution in 54 Arab and Muslim countries. And, yeah, like, it's it's... Like, I don't think that James Cameron is largely a hateful individual. Like, it's very clear that a lot of his politics are very progressive. But, like, I don't know. I hope he got therapy after this because, holy crap, there's a lot of hatred for... Keeping in mind, he wrote and directed it. Every single performance by one of them was directed by him. And it's not like he's known for just... You know, ah, whatever, just do whatever. No, he, he gets the performances out of his cast that he wants. So, yeah, he had issues at the time. And let's see. So, the yeah, uh, it was Schwarzenegger who watched, yeah, uh, La Totale, or in English, The Jackpot from 1991, a French film. And, yeah, Schwarzenegger liked the idea, and, let's see, yeah, and, and, you know, asked, told Cameron, gotta watch this movie, we gotta make a movie out of it, and Cameron loved the idea of presenting a secret agent with nearly unlimited professional resources as a family man, basically asking the question, who would James Bond be if he got home and had to answer to his wife and decided to make the movie? And I, I do see some of that in here, but, like, it doesn't feel like there's that much empathy for this, you know, for, for Helen, his wife, that he largely just doesn't, like, I'll, I'll grant that, you know, his job means he can't spend as much time with her as he would like, but he also doesn't really listen to her, like, it's just, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, Lindsay Ellis points this out, the movie both says that the men in it are kind of, kind of don't listen to the you know their the their female partners but also oh they're just overworked you should have more empathy but it's just 
it is this very like awkward kind of just yeah it 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 feels like i don't know did his therapist just move away just before and and like this movie feels like therapy and i'm not 100% of against that it is as just a concept if you just if you're just like trying to work through some issues but if you have this much hate just like take it to a therapist now let's see oh, right and uh, IMDb fact points out that Harry shares a lot of character traits with 007 like being an international spy who can speak several languages has several false identities is skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat use of firearms knowledge of terrorists and their strategies high, has a high-tech arsenal of computerized systems and gadgets at his, at his disposal to do his job and let's see yeah James Cameron originally hired a team of writers to help him come up with the film's jokes however after being mostly unsatisfied with their work Cameron let them go and decided to try his own hand at comedy he rewrote the script from scratch and kept only two jokes from the team of writers. Let's see. And yeah. And he, James Cameron, thought of the film as a love story first and foremost, which you know he thinks of all, all of his movies. He, in his own opinion, are love stories. You know, it's different kinds of love, but all of them are about, you know, yeah, love and. Yeah, like, I I really, really hope this doesn't reflect how he treats the women. And if, if, you know, if it does, then for sure, no wonder that he, no wonder he got divorced multiple times. Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, a couple of quotes from the comments section of, I think this was actually, I think this was Roger Ebert's review. Yeah, this person says, you know, some Arabs commit to acts of terrorism in the name of Islam. Yeah, but the movie acts like it's basically all, like it's, like if you are a highly, you know, highly religious, you know, really Muslim Arab, you're probably a terrorist. Like the movie could easily there's there's many characters in this movie. Only there's only one good Muslim, and I don't think he mentions his faith once. Like there's he like you can tell from looking at his face he you know I'm thinking he's an he's an immigrant because his his English is completely flawless. But like his ancestors were probably from the Middle East never brings up his faith and like the, basically the movie if if this was the only movie you watched about muslims you would think that the only way for someone with you know semitic features to be a good person is if they just never bring up their religion let's see and and yeah the, this comment section you know this commenter goes on to say you know, would you rather have a Russian, you know, and it's like, first of all, those are not, that that's a false dichotomy, you could easily have had others, and, I mean, kind of, yeah, because Russians did not have, there's not the, the kind of hatred towards, you know, as far as I know, I don't know the, the numbers off the top of my head, but as far as I know, there are way more hate crimes directed at Muslim immigrants in America than ones from Eastern Europe. And let's see. Yeah, you know, thankfully, some of the other commenters point out the 9 11 attacks were in direct response to U.S. foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. Now, that of course does not mean that the people who died and the, their families they did not deserve 9-11 of course not that would be absurd but you can't claim that they just came out of nowhere and did this like you should direct your hatred not only towards the individual terrorists who did it who of course deserve to be hated they didn't have to go for terrorism they didn't have to kill civilians but also the 
the people in in charge during these you know just if you look into it like it's the the kinds of things that america the the yeah that america has done to other countries and it just yeah you know in the in the muslim world but also like latin america and just yeah and another commenter points, or possibly the same commenter, but a commenter points out, since 9-11, the number one domestic terror threat is white right-wing men, and it's not even close. If you want to see a river of tears, point out this fact to white right-wing men. The GOP threw such a fit over the Obama DOJ's report on right-wing terrorism that it was rescinded. That lack of accountability or action predictably got us where we are now, white right-wing trying to overthrow the government. And, uh, yeah, one points out, you won't see a major studio movie made out of liberal Hollywood about white terrorists because Hollywood is controlled by corporations who don't want to offend conservative snowflakes. You do get a sympathetic portrayal of white right-wing war criminal Chris Kyle. This reality will not stop white right-wing men from crying because they are perpetual victims in their own minds. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and one person point out, the racist portrayal of Arabs made this film unwatchable. For me, it got extremely close to that. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, I think there's a reason why I've only watched this movie three times. Like, this is the, uh, I guess I only watched The Abyss once, but other than that, this is, and I'm just, I'm not that, I'm not that big on deep sea stuff. It just doesn't do anything for me, so, you know, um, yeah. I really haven't watched this movie very many times, and it tends to be that, like, a lot of years pass between two viewings. Just, yeah, the the, the racism and misogyny made this extremely hard to, to watch. Especially, like, there's a section, near, near the end, it's like, okay, come on, just stop. And eventually there is, like, you know, it dials it back a little bit, but it's still, just, yeah. And uh, let's see, yeah, and in this comment thread, in response to uh, two comments, the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was an act of state-sponsored terrorism, fact, and the United States is the largest sponsor of terrorism in world history, which, again, just look at, just, yeah. A conservative comment poster claimed that at least one of the others was trying to control his thoughts and prevent him from loving specific movies, which was 100% not even remotely what he was doing. He, you know, he was criticizing the movie. There's a huge difference between the two. Because he knew he couldn't actually counter the arguments made. So he just has to make it about censorship and, you know, just, yeah. And let's see. Right, so some critic quotes. True Lies is the closest Cameron gets to making a full-on James Bond film. And honestly, if we're going to go for, like, a um, James Bond movie made by, you know, a, that isn't quite an official James Bond movie, like, I think Tenet is, is much, much better. I'm not comparing, like, obviously it has bigger action. That's just a fact of, like, filmmaking has gotten inc incredibly, like, action... Big budget action blockbusters today are huge. They're they're much much bigger than they were in the '90s. I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about how that movie does not have the kind of hatred that this movie does. But yeah, so uh, full on James Bond James Bond spy film. The movie contains many of the hallmarks of the British super spy series: exotic locales, black tie affairs, femme fatales, life and death stakes, and let's see. As recounted in Rebecca Keegan's The Futurist, Cameron explains Bond himself is a pathetic eternal bachelor who will never know the truth of what it is to be a man, to be a husband and father, which is why that fantasy works, especially for married men, because Bond has nobody to answer to. While James Bond famously pledged loyalty to the Queen, ultimately Harry Tasker has his own majesty that demands his loyalty, his wife. And that's, again, like, it's wild to me that... This movie is not, does not treat Helen like a queen, and neither does Harry. And, let's see. Oh, right, this is actually, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I, that's kind of a spoiler, so I'm gonna put it in the spoiler section. In the second spoiler section, to be 
clear. Now, since I have made a number of criticisms of this movie, I do want to prove that it could easily have been much, you know, it didn't have to be such a hateful movie. I will, I, I have some suggestions for rewrites that would address the issues with the film. Several of them will be at the very start of the second thoughts section. Some of them might end up during the, the first thought section because I only thought of them as I was watching the movie rather than before. And, yeah, one critic says, Cameron does the best he can with what he had to work with. He wrote the script, the concept was his idea, he could have tried to get help to write it. What he had to work with was his own doing. And, right, there was this one user review, and it's literally, I'm, I'm going to quote the entire thing. This is, yeah. If you don't like this movie, no offense, but fuck you. First off, fuck you right back. Second off, what's offensive about that? Third off, do you even care why people don't like it? Lots of Muslims have had their lives ruined by this and other racist movies. And that's not even getting, you know, there's also the misogyny and the way it talks about, like, teen, like, the idea of teen sexuality is just really, really gross. There's a lot to hate in this movie. And, yeah, the movie does a really good job with plot twists. There are not too many. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say any of them are really bad. There's not, they're not too few. They're not too easy to figure out for the viewer. And the movie doesn't fall apart once you learn certain twists. And yeah, the, that brings us to the direction. So, worst to best ranking of James Cameron movies directed, regardless of writer, and, <clears throat> you know, yeah, ranking all other, all except for this particular one, and all of the ones, you know, yeah, like I mentioned, I love all except for, for this one, so... I'm not ranking, you know, I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. So, worst to best, The Abyss, Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic, Terminator 2, Aliens, and Terminator 1. And, let's see. Yeah, and I want to just briefly point out, of, of all the white people I've met, way higher percentage of them were assholes compared to the percentage of assholes among non-white immigrants. I've met a lot of Muslims because my father used to teach them Danish. I live in Denmark and so does he. And yeah, they're, you know, they're very grateful for the, the you know, the, the freedom and, and tolerance and yeah, they, they're really, really great people, most of them. And let's see. Yeah, and, and James Berardinelli says, you know, ah, is it a better comedy or a better action film? I don't know why people feel the need to, to do these weird, just, yeah, it's great. It's, it's, it's great as a comedy, great as an action film. And, let's see, the film balances its action and comic set pieces reasonably successfully. Its cast delivers some great performances. The movie is bogged down by an unfunny subplot that bloats the running time as well as a lack of memorable villains. It does remain one of the gold standards of 90s Hollywood blockbusters. And, uh, yeah, after 9-11, Cameron decided not to do a sequel. He would say, terrorism is no longer something to take as lightly as we did in the first one. I just can't see it happening given the current world climate. And, yeah, I already mentioned that I think that Team America is an incredibly funny film. And uh, Jim Lee Curtis said, terrorists aren't funny anymore. They never were, but it was distant enough from our psyche that we could make it funny. It'll never be funny again. I just think that that, that is over. That kind of humor is over. So, yeah, um, definitely an action comedy with thriller aspects and there is actually some mystery to it which works 
really well. The opening really sets up very, very nicely the the how difficult Harry's spy job is, how exceptionally good he is at it. And I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. And, yeah, you know, it delivers what it's supposed to. Um, I think an argument could be made that there's Deus Ex Machina convenient writing, but it's not really unique to the ending, but just, yeah. And uh, this doesn't have a post credit scene as such, but there is this very short bit, I don't know, I guess you would call it a mid credit uh, yeah mid credit scene that you do not want to miss it's very short and it's very very it's right at the start of the like some some of the end credits play over part of a scene once that scene has ended we get a brief scene after that and yeah that brings us to the characters so let's see um yeah so one Critics said that the you know James Cameron didn't think that it was that that Arnie could act like a human being. So you know yes if, yeah this guy says the the solution is stuff the film with cartoonish supporting turns hope to God no one notices him. I really really first of all I don't think that's why. Second of all, I think it's the exact right choice for this. Like, if this movie was played... Like, I, th I think that might be why some people don't realize how racist and misogynist it is. When you, when you push things, when they get to a certain extreme, like, we kind of stop thinking of them as related to reality, you know? Yeah, like, they, they look like human beings, but they don't act like it. Like, nobody in this is completely credible as just a human being. Like, everyone says and does really ridiculous stuff that just... So, yeah, I, I think it was the only way to, to smokescreen and, and, like... Yeah, there's even occasional lampshading of how misogynist and racist it is. Like, the, there are characters who will point out, wow, this is really messed up, isn't it? But, you know, there's always something that means that they don't stop being ridiculous. And, yeah, this critic goes on to say, Bill Paxson's loony sleazeball, Jamie Lee Curtis' awkward housefrau persona, Tom Arnold's motor mouth sidekick. Let's see. And... Surprisingly, Foulmouth, Charlton Heston, Vampish, Chia Carrera, Art Malik's pantomime terrorist. See, that's a really good... Yeah, pantomime. That is... Yeah. Let's see. And... Um, yeah, everyone really delivers. Like, everyone except maybe Dushku gets to be funny. Like, she's... She's severely underused. The the like there are parts of the movie where you almost end up like wondering why is she in this like and I I don't only mean casting someone of her talent although was this before she was really discovered she she became much more popular in the years following this on Buffy you know so yeah it's possible that she wasn't already considered like a really huge but like. She was talented. She did. She really does deliver in in this. If, but but yeah. Beyond that, even like the characters, like why is she here other than for for Cameron to vent about how obnoxious you know kids are to their parents? That's really most for most of the movie. That's that's that would be my guess. But yeah, you know, everyone makes a meal out of their character. Everyone really steps up to bat, nobody in this comes across as, like, embarrassed to be there, which you could understand based on the, the material they're given, but no, everyone, like, leaps into it, no, like, no reservations at all. So yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays Harry Tasker, extremely funny in this movie, by which I, of course, mean it's a movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger is asked to be funny, and... It's not, like, primarily, perhaps com combined with a drama, a comedy. 
you know, I, I don't know why it, it just, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is at least one movie that is a comedy and or drama where Arnold Schwarzenegger is supposed to be funny and it isn't just like super painful to watch. Like, I'll just briefly go over. So yeah, I haven't watched Hercules in New York, but I did watch a video review. It seemed terrible. So I'm not saying that the movie is, I'm just saying it seemed that. Then we have things like, let's see, so, so yeah, you know, he's funny in The Terminator, a couple of times. He's funny in Commando, uh, I forget if he's funny in Conan, um, it's been a while since I watched him. Yeah, he's funny in Predator, The Running Man, but yeah, we have stuff like Twins, Kindergarten Cop, I think some of the time in Last Action Hero he does work. But again, action comedy. Junior, like just... And I hear Jingle All The Way is, is terrible, but I haven't watched it, so I'm not going to personally make a claim that it is. Yeah, I it's just... It's it's wild. Just the, the, the... He can be funny. He can be incredibly funny. But every time that it's just a straight comedy, or in the case of Twins, a dramedy, it's just painful to watch. And yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, Schwarzenegger said, this was the film I was meant for. So, yeah. And he dreamt about playing a James Bond kind of spy when he was a kid. And of out of all the movies, this is the one he enjoyed the most, along with Jamie Lee Curtis. And let's see, yeah... Arnold primarily felt as he if he was in a Bond film, but with more leeway and privilege to play his character, with a story that included plenty of comedy. He was quoted describing it as a life changer and something I would do again if I ever got the chance. And you know, one one critic says the character is basically a cross between James Bond and Ethan Hunt. Now, Ethan Hunt did not have the the first Mission Impossible movie came out two years after this, but yeah, there is definitely you know there's a there's a bit of a in, in some ways, this character is closer to an Ethan Hunt than James Bond. Now, Jamie Lee Curtis as Helen Tasker. And I, this is one of those cases where, like, on the one hand, I feel bad for the kind of ridiculous stuff she's asked to, to do in, in a lot of it. But on the other hand, like, she's one of the best. Like, when she gets to be funny on her own terms, when she gets to really, like, make make something big out of this character, she is just, it's, you can't take your eyes off her, like, she is just, like, I've, I've said it before, and I will say it again, she is just, she's so funny, so fierce, like, she can do, like, she can come across as, like, a badass, she can just, yeah, uh, just absolutely love her work. And according to IMDb Trivia, Jimmy Lee Curtis said in his contract, Schwarzenegger gets top billing, then the title, then it would have said starring Jamie Lee Curtis. But when James Cameron finished editing the film and he saw that the film was really a domestic epic, it's a film about marriage, James Cameron phoned Schwarzenegger, asked him if it would be okay to put Jamie Lee Curtis's name before the title. Schwarzenegger immediately agreed in the world of show business. As Curtis stated, the credit is, credit is such a coveted negotiable commodity for Schwarzenegger to give her billing before the title was a real mensch move on his part. Very true. And she actually won a Golden Globe for this movie. And let's see. Yeah, Cameron had known Curtis since she had been directed by his ex-wife, Catherine Bigelow, in Blue Steel, 1990. Always wanted to work with her. Schwarzenegger initially did not see her as Helen, and let's see, uh, yeah, and, and originally Cameron was going to say, okay, it's not going to be Curtis, he auditioned many actresses to find a replacement, but after watching Curtis in A Fish Called Wanda, where she is amazing. That that definitely does also have problematic aspects. But like, if you haven't watched in a while and you remember liking it, like, she's amazing in that movie. She they they really, yeah, just yeah. Uh, he knew he would not find one, so Cameron went to Schwarzenegger, asked if he trusted him, and you know Schwarzenegger says, "I trust you." 
It's going to be Jamie, said Cameron. Of course, Snyder begrudgingly agreed to his credit, showed no negative feelings towards Curtis during the first days on set. In fact, he became so impressed with her performance, he later shared top billing with her. And, yeah, the, the role was written for Jamie Lee Curtis, even though a lot of actresses auditioned for it. And it is, like, I don't... I don't know that I could see anyone else really playing, like... I feel like... I, I know that it's Ginger Gonzaga in the in the current running streaming show. I do really like her. I think she did an incredible job on She-Hulk. I have to imagine that they retooled the character somewhat, though, because, like... Jamie Lee Curtis, there's, I'm not sure there's anyone who could completely do what, what she can. There are a lot of great actresses in Hollywood. And, uh, yeah, Curtis was glad her character was nervous. She was nervous about some scenes, too. And, let's see. Yeah, originally Cameron was just going to watch... 10 minutes of A Fish Called Wanda ended up watching the entire film late at night in a hotel room. And, yeah, it's no wonder why. it is, And it's also a movie that really grabs you from right away. And, yeah, Jodie Foster was cast as Helen Tasker. And then she had to turn the role down because she was signed to Nell, also in 1994. I don't think I've seen very many Foster roles where she does comedy. She can do, like, the kind of intensity that some of the role of Helen requires. I'm not going to go on and claim that she can't be funny. I don't remember seeing it. I, I can, like, she's incredibly talented and has been for decades. So I'm not going to discount. And, and Cameron usually casts talented people. You know, I've, I'm not sure I've... I'm not sure I can think of a, a case where, like, he cast someone and it was like, I don't know, maybe, I, I guess an argument could be made for um, J uh, Jake Sully. What's his name again? The actor. Something. You know, uh, an argument could maybe be made that he wasn't, that he's not an amazing actor. But other than that, I, I don't think there's anyone that, like, I, I, the first time I heard that Tom Arnold was in this, I was like, Really, but he's he's really really solid in it, and yeah, he plays Albert Gibb Gibson. Uh, Tom Arnold didn't expect to get a role in the movie and went to the audition mostly for the chance to meet director James Cameron. He did some scenes with Schwarzenegger. Cameron immediately noticed the chemistry between the two actors, which also really shows in in the film. Like they're really really great. Afterwards, Tom Arnold jokingly said about Schwarzenegger, "He's not that big. I think I can take him," which highly amused Cameron and sealed the deal. That is. That is legitimately a funny thing for, for Tom Arnold to say. And, you know, there's a lot of the movie where they're, like, right next to each other. So you have, you know, like, Tom Arnold... Like, like I said, this is a movie where no one is acting completely normal. So we can accept, okay, Tom Arnold, spy, whatever, you know. But when the two of them are next to each other and, like... Yeah, it's it's really funny to imagine that the yeah. Initially, Fox objected because Tom Arnold's reputation at the time wasn't positive, mostly due to his public antics with then-wife Roseanne Barr. When Cameron threatened to take the movie somewhere else, if Arnold wouldn't be couldn't be cast, they relented because if James Cameron wants to have his way on a movie, if he needs to say "fuck you" to your face, if he needs to threaten to take the movie somewhere else. He's going to do it. You know, when I when I did my video on, on Titanic, I quoted, you know, he said, if you want, what was it? It was something like, if you want to cut that out of the movie, you're going to have to fire me. You want to fire me? You're going to have to kill me. And it's like, okay. Let's all take a deep breath. You know what? Okay, on on second thought, maybe that cut is not necessary. And let's see. Yeah, and Tom Arnold later learned about this. He was grateful to Cameron for taking a chance on him. He became a good friend of Short Singer and Cameron afterwards. And yeah, Tom Arnold said that he and Harry are the only ones totally honest with each other in the movie, and it's very true. And that actually, they get some really great material out of that because it is like, you know, when Harry like. Harry learns something about his wife that makes him very upset, and like, 
Gib is like trying to calm him back down and like saying, you know, if you think about this and this, and he is powerfully terrible at like, you know, after he says some things, like Harry grabs him and says, stop cheering me up. And it's, yeah, it's it's very, very funny, you know, and, and, and basically like Gib realizes how messed up what they're doing is, but he's been strong-armed into going along with it, and there's like times where he's like, I can't believe we're doing this, this is, I am, well, at one point he literally says, I'm going to hell. And yeah, it's, it's funny because it's true. Tom Arnold said, this is his favorite movie he's ever been in. And Tom Arnold was so sure he wouldn't get this role that he asked if he could audition for a smaller part. And just, yeah, you know, if you make a positive impression on James Cameron, he may well put you in not only one movie, but like four. You know, Bill Paxton was like, I think he was like a carpenter on The Terminator. And Cameron was like, you know, I kind of, you have a thing I like. And, you know, he gets a cameo in that role, in, in that movie major role in this, in Aliens, I suppose, maybe not major, but he is an important character in Titanic, you know, so, yeah, three roles where he's like, you know, ev everybody remembers him from the film, and he has, you know, he has enough screen time, I mean, an argument could be made, like, Bill Paxton in Titanic, you know, he's in the present day stuff, the present day stuff does not make up that much of the film, and he's in most of the present day stuff, so, you know, comparatively, it's a big role, and yeah, because he, you know, he made an impression on on James Cameron, and you know, I like, I, you know, I love Bill Paxton, R.I.P. in everything I've ever seen him in, but I do think that James Cameron was like of all the people Bill Paxton worked with when he was alive. James Cameron got some of the best stuff out of him, and this is one of his best performances. That, that's another, like, if you like Bill Paxton, like, you can maybe suffer through the rest of, the, because for, for the, you know, he's not quite as compelling here as he is in Aliens, but he is more compelling than in Titanic, and, you know, yeah, I mentioned that he's not, he is only a cameo in the first Terminator, but, but yeah, like, you know, Bill Paxton, like, he can do this kind of, Oh, tough guy, like smooth, and everything's going my way, and then like trail off into absolute panic without it feeling like it's two different characters. You know, it's it's actually, he, yeah, he has a bit of the Bruce Campbell thing going on. Also, uh, you know, I have to admit, I haven't seen Bruce Campbell in very much other than the Evil Dead movies, and yes, I am doing. The new one as soon as it comes to theaters here uh, which is currently looking like it'll be like in two weeks or so you know the the th this thing of like bravado and then oh shit things are going wrong you know just yeah and and yeah clearly james cameron likes giving bill paxton roles like this because here and in aliens you know and yeah Overall, he's better in Aliens, but, yeah. And, and like, kudos to Bill Paxton for, like, not having too much of an ego for the, the kind of, like, you know, James Cameron likes making him look kind of ridiculous in, in various ways across the, the various movies. And, yeah, you know, he, he keeps coming back. He's clearly enjoying himself in, in these Art Malik plays Salim Abu Aziz, and according to IMDb Trivia, he was offered more roles in other action films after this, but turned them down. I didn't want to do action movies that weren't as good, which is very admirable. And, yeah, uh, he's amazing in it, you know. Wish it wasn't such a racist depiction, but, like, it's actually, yeah, I saw, you know, one other, one, one critic said, oh, it doesn't really have memorable villains. I disagree. I think Aziz is very memorable. It's just if part of it is because he's it's such a racist depiction. Bill Paxton plays Simon, and I don't think I want to give too much away about his character because I had forgotten. Like I remembered his character. I didn't remember how the character is introduced. I don't think I'm going to give away exactly what 
the the character is. Um, just yeah, not only what I've already said, but yeah, this is some of his best work. He's he's so funny and just yeah. Tia Carrer plays Juno Skinner, and she named this as her favorite role of all time because I got to be a villain. And she really like you know vampy and just like she's she's basically like this seductive kind of you know and like it's really misogynist in how like she's just yeah like it it's it's one of those things where it's like i mean i don't i don't know i don't know if james cameron cheated on his wives but if he didn't i think it was a mistake for him to to handle the Juno Skinner character like this because it smacks of I swear honey I did nothing she jumped on to me you just didn't see it because she, when you walked in the room she had already jumped on to me I I swear there is no reason for us to get a divorce because I know that it would hurt me more than it would hurt you and I don't think you deserve to hurt me back, even though I just cheated on her. It's, it's very, like, if, if the, if this movie was a person, like, it would be screaming about all its anxieties, but, but yeah, she does an incredible job, and some of the material is also really, really good, and she, like, I, I haven't seen her in a lot, but I think everything else, I've, yeah, she got to be a villain. I think everything else I've seen her in, she was one of the good guys, and, you know, her being seductive, they, they do that in a bunch of the the things she's in, but here she's also like she's deliciously evil. You know, fa yeah, femme fatale, very much this, you know, and yeah, like respect. A lot of femme fatales are white women. So I really respect that Cameron cast, you know I mean, I, I'm not one hundred percent certain I get is it is she Latina? Oh, oh, here, yeah, here we go. She's from Hawaii. Yeah, he's she's Hawaiian. That's right. Yes, I I totally see that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be clear, there are definitely some movies where the femme fatale is like coded as other, not a white woman, you know. But yeah, there there are a bunch where it is like of yeah. I I I do respect that. Yeah. Eliza Dushku plays Dana Tasker, and I don't have a lot to say about her character. I will talk about the um, the grooming and and molestation in when I get into the thoughts section. But there are some quotes about that that are very important to get into that are spoilers for the movie. So, but yeah, like she does a a good job. Like um, you know, basis. For some of her screen time, it's basically just she's not really, she doesn't really respect her parents or adults in general. She also doesn't seem to respect Gib, for example. Uh, she doesn't really, yeah, she, yeah, she's not really respectful. But yeah, like, Dushku, like, again, this is the kind of thing that you can make into, like, a cartoon character. Like, I fairly recently watched The Whale, and while Sadie Sink does a phenomenal job, like, you know, that character does end up coming across like a, a cartoon villain, a Saturday morning cartoon villain, and it's not, it's really not her fault, it's the, it's the direction, you know, um, I love Darren Aronofsky, I think almost everything he's done is amazing, he is not a big fan of, like, if, if there's a character who's supposed to be doing something bad in one of his movies, he's probably going to turn them into a cartoon villain. That's that's a very common thing, yeah. Grant Heslov is Faisal. I think they pronounce it Faisal. And basically, like, he, you know, it comes across as kind of model minority, but yeah, you know, he is, he has dark brown skin, and... I don't know if he is originally from the, the Middle East or if his family immigrated there originally, but certainly he can pass for that. The the yeah, the skin color and the traits, he, he you know, very, very Semitic traits. And I do really respect nobody in the movie is like, okay, 
you know, we're dealing with Arabs, let's put Faisal in an internment camp, or, I don't know, maybe Faisal's in on it, or anything like that. Like, some of the other spies bust his balls, but it's because he's new, or because he, you know, it's, it's never based on, like, the fact that he has brown skin, you know, so, yeah. I, I do really respect that. It's, you know, I, I wish it didn't come across as, like, James Cameron basically saying, please don't boycott my movie. I swear I don't hate all Muslims. Look, I put a good Muslim in there. He's one of the good ones, don't you understand? Some of my best friends, some of Harry's best friends are Muslim, you know, but he is legit. Like, he gets to be in on the joke. He gets to be funny. He gets to be memorable, you know. So the... the yeah, you know, but the, the, yeah, I think I've said what I, so yeah, Charlton Heston, RIP, played Spencer Trilby. Now, according to IMDb Victoria, the appearance and traits of the character is based on Nick Fury. This is, you know, for those who are only familiar with Marvel through stuff like the MCU, before, I wanted, was it like 2000, 2000 or 2001, before that, Nick Fury was white, so it's not that they t took a black character and turned him white. It, you know, in the comics, in one of the relaunches, they took a white character and and made him black and and based his appearance on Samuel Jackson. You know, but but yeah, when this movie was made, the only Nick Fury, the the main Nick Fury, at least it's possible there were others, uh, multiverse and stuff, but the main Nick Fury was an old white guy. And let's see, yeah, so both of them have an eye patch and similar mannerisms, and both head a peacekeeping organization. At one point, Cameron wanted to be a comic book penciler and does a lot of his own concept art. He even designed the entire T-800 endoskeleton. So, yeah, it's it's very cool when he puts, and, and that's also, like, if you watch The Terminator, like, okay, this was made by someone who likes comic books because, like, there's way too many cool concepts in one thing for it to not have, like, inspirations from a comic book. Like, regular movies, movies that are not made by people who love comic books are not this much, this this creative and this much fun. Like, they, they take one sci-fi aspect and then they go with that. But no, you know... You know. And obviously, if I did start talking at this point in this video about all the different sci-fi aspects, I would be spoiling major aspects of that movie. But if you've watched it, I'm sure you can, you know, you can figure out what I'm referring to. And let's see. Um... Right, so, yes, one critic quote, uh, Schwarzenegger is fantastic as Harry Tasker, effortless, effortlessly succeeding on the film's comedic and action aspects. It was filled with memorable and creative action set pieces from its opening to its climax, and the action is complemented with some very well-delivered humor. Uh, Arn, uh, uh, Gibb is a great foil for Harry, and the two have a natural comic chemistry that comes through in the heat of action or in slower paced scenes, driving to work or around the office. Curtis does quite well as Helen, serves an, as an effective straight man to the comic bits in parts of the movie. It does also feel like she's somewhat sidelined side in parts of the movie. They don't have much of an idea what to do with her, very true. Dushku is good for what's required of her, but there's unfortunately not much given to her. And... Right, so dialogue, there's some exposition by way of people telling each other things that they already know. And, you know, it's it's a spy film, there's a there's a briefing, or I guess debriefing scene. Of course, there's it's very difficult to avoid that, but it does also feel like, you know, they didn't, like Cameron didn't have a better idea of, of how to do it, and... You know, his dialogue writing is not his strongest suit, but there are some really memorable, you know, bits. And the cinematography was handled by... 
I will have a moment to share. Uh, there we go. Yeah, Russell Carpenter. And yeah, he does a really solid job. Like, it feels like a Bond movie. It feels like a comedy. It's. Yeah. And the. You know, like other things James Cameron has directed, you know, there's a very clear. Like, the, the camera tends to be very purposeful. Like, if, if there's something important for us to notice, the camera is going to, you know, it's going to show it without, like, not, not, not necessarily to where it makes it obvious, but just, like, we notice a thing, and then later, the thing becomes really important. The editing was handled by Conrad Buff the Fourth, Mark Goldblatt, Richard A. Harris, and James Cameron. And yeah, there's some you know overlap with some of his other movies. And yeah, the editing is really really solid. Like James Cameron does love these really like. Not necessarily the most usual, but like he'll he'll use he'll use cuts that are very very effective and, and like there's this one part where one character like lights a cigarette and then it cuts to another character who's already smoking and just um yeah it's not a spoiler to say these two characters are both watching the other. And trying to pretend like they're not watching the other. So it's it's a great, just like, you know, it's yeah, it's basically a match cut. And it's it's just fantastic stuff. Like it really works. It the the it it helps create a sort of tension. Like it's it's it, they're they're basic it's like a it's like a poker game, you know. You you can't, you know, the the fa you can't read their face. It's like what are they thinking? What are they gonna do? Kind of thing, and just yeah, it's 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 simple but effective. And there's, um, yeah, there are some there are some scenes that easily could just be like a character explaining a thing, but instead they're turned into flashbacks. So we visually see like this. Spy movies can get stuck with like a lot of like just walls of exposition and just like okay here we go I guess I don't know maybe this is time for a bathroom break because people are just gonna ramble on for a little while and that really doesn't happen very much here uh, there's there's base there's there's at least one scene where it is just like people stating things that everybody knows and and to be fair like the explanation is that the boss is like you blew it. You're you're total screw ups. What what is this? Tell tell me what you have. You know, and the others are like trying to build up to a a conclusion. So they you know they they they're, they're like okay. So we all know that this person is responsible for this, and we're worried about this thing. We think these two things could come together, and there's a thing here. You know, so you know hypothetically if they didn't say and it's also like they're they're you know they 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 got caught by the teacher kind of thing so they're like ah uh, gee just you know sir uh, you know in our defense you know kind of thing so they're just trying to talk their way out of being in trouble so it works and and just yeah i really admire like i had actually i had forgotten because there is there's this one part of the movie where like I mean, yeah, it's not a spoiler to say, someone is being interrogated. There are some questions and answers, and, yeah, like, a lot of movies and TV shows would just have, like, talking, and they would try to make the, the dialogue snappy, and good performances, and maybe some close-ups, and some effective editing. But, like, cameras, like, why would I do that when I can just do, and, and it's basically, like, there's, like, three flashbacks in, like, couple of minutes time and it's like who does that who does like you you're not you're not supposed to do you know but it works it absolutely works uh, you know and and yeah i i really like james cameron 
usually makes things visually appealing in his movies, and this is very much another case of that. And, oh, right, and there's some really excellent use of parallel action and reaction shots. And, you know, the editing is, of course, one of the places where the, the tension and suspense, both, like, you know, it's, it's built and maintained, and, like, he keeps you all the way, like, he, he does not let up until he's 100% ready to, to let up. And, and yeah, uh, you know, hot take, James Cameron is amazing at making a, like, getting us to, to the edge of our seat and keeping us there for, like, you would think that it'd be like, okay, it's exhausting, just stop, but no, he, he, he knows exactly when to release the tension and for it to be just, yeah. Now, the, let's see, that brings us to the filming so yeah this was filmed uh let's see yeah so some yeah some of this was shot in LA and let's see some of it Rhode Island Florida Keys Toronto I uh, yeah and he makes really good use of all of these locations If anyone watching is one of the people who just add USA and nothing else as a filming location, bless your heart, you're, you're precious. And the... Because the idea is you, you add at least a little bit more than that. Maybe at least a state. But anyway. And the, yeah, yeah, the action is legitimately, like... It's not the the very very best, uh, you know, but it is some of the most varied action out of Cameron's oeuvre, and just yeah, you know the you know in the in the Terminator movies he likes to where where a lot of filmmakers will be like okay we have an action scene here I don't know uh chase or maybe they're fighting or maybe they're running or you know and James Cameron is like. Okay, hear me out on this. What if we start out with people shooting at each other? Then we have some running, then we have some fighting, and then a car chase. And it's like, you know, other other filmmakers are like, are we al I, are we allowed to do this? Is this a thing? Like, and and just yeah, he does it here too. He does like, yeah, action scenes. You know, it just like he really he puts to shame so many like big action movies by showing you can actually get so much more like just yeah so yeah we have chases on foot and in vehicles we have physical fights shooting including shooting while in vehicles shooting at vehicles and you know there are cars there are uh what, what are they called again like jet, jet ski or you know yeah, there are skis, there are helicopters, just, yeah. And, let's see, that brings us to the music. So, the music is handled by Brad Fidel, and it's not quite as good as, like, you know, he did such an amazing job on The Terminator... Both, both Terminator movies, really. Uh, amazing music. And here, like, it's just not quite as good. But it is good. It is, you know, yeah. It, it gets the blood pumping when when there's tension and suspense. And just, yeah. And let's see. the Yeah, so pacing... Something, or, uh, I have, yeah, a couple of quick quotes before I get into it myself. Something around the middle sidetracks the plot. The movie is 135 minutes long, and, see, yeah, it would definitely, if you cut at least 15 minutes, it would be a lot better. Let's see, and, um, 
yeah, and yeah, so several people criticize the the middle, and I'm going to get into details about the middle when I get into the spoilers. But it, yeah, I'm not going to give away here what exactly. Now the movie is, let's see, I think it was two, it, yeah, two hours and eighteen minutes before the end credits start, and it says here two minutes and twenty one when the credits are rolled, but you know. After two hours and eighteen minutes, you you can stop watching, you know. But yeah, and and this isn't really one of those movies where you could just like uh, I don't know. Let's let's just jump past. You know, it's James Cameron. Every single scene has some purpose. You know, I kind of wish that he would have made some of them like you know not necessary to the point where maybe he would even have ended up cutting them out. Maybe he would have felt. Like, he got, you know, maybe it was maybe he would have felt like it was therapeutic enough to write and direct these scenes. Maybe he didn't feel the need to also put them in the final cut. But no, he did. And here we are. And, yeah. Um, I am going to make some specific arguments about the middle when I get into the thoughts. But for now, I will just say... It definitely, like, as it is, you can't really edit it down, but in the writing stage, like, I really wish that... So, so yeah, what, what I'm saying is, I wish that he had, once he had, you know, written and directed these scenes, he would have been like, okay, whatever, I, I'll, I'll write around so I don't need to put these scenes in the final cut, you know, but, yeah. And... So yes, the, the best elements of this are tied between how much fun you can have watching it, the acting, and the worst aspect is tied between the racism and misogyny. And yeah, so the, the, the worst thing according to others was that it's bloated and there's no character development. I don't think I really agree that there's no character development, but... I don't. Th a lot of the character development makes characters look bad in a really, you know, hateful way. The thing I was most worried about before my first viewing was disrespectful, insensitive depiction of terrorism, and yeah, kind of is yeah that. The thing I was most looking forward to was more Cameron and Arnie collaboration, and yeah, you know, the they made three movies together, and all three of them are very entertaining to watch. Although there are some issues. Now, the trailers do give too much away. Uh, this is the kind of thing where like it's difficult to get across much of the appeal of the movie without spoiling anything. And, you know, if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if not. The cover and poster do not give too much away. Um they uh, yeah, they give you an okay idea. Like, the poster is basically just Arnold looking determined with a with a gun in his hand, and there's like the the symbol for the um, peacekeeping organizations behind him. You know, it just tells you that there's it's an army. Yeah, yeah, and the tagline gives you an idea that it's going to be a, a comedy about a marriage. That, that there's going to be comedy relating to his marriage. So. Yeah. Um, let's see. Right, that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where it has a 70% based on 54 reviews. Yeah, 38 fresh, 16 rotten. The average rating was 6.60 out of 10. The uh, audience rating is 76% based on over 250,000 ratings. The average rating is 3.8 out of 5. The consensus, if it doesn't reach the heights of director James Cameron's and yeah, Schwarzenegger's previous collaborations, True Lies still packs enough action and humor into its sometimes absurd plot to entertain. On Metacritic, it has 63 out of 100, based on 17 critic reviews, 10 positive, 6 mixed, 1 negative, and the user 
score is 8.4 out of 10 based on 319 ratings, 272 positive, 32 mixed, 15 negative, and let's see. Yeah, there are a couple of negative reviews, but most of them, most of the user reviews are positive. On IMDB, it has. Oh, there we go. There are 462 reviews, user reviews on IMDB, 377 without spoilers, and uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I read the top voted 100, the including the ones with spoilers. And yeah, so of the 100 most popular user reviews, three gave it a one, one gave it a two, one gave it a three, three gave it a four, seven gave it a five, five gave it a six, 15 gave it a seven, 21 gave it an eight, 20 gave it a nine, and 26 gave it a ten. So yeah, the the reviews that are in favor of the movie are the most popular. And I was able to read 48 of the 106 links in the IMDb external reviews section. And the, yeah, so the overall rating is 7.3 out of 10 based on 267,000 votes. 30.8% gave it 7, 26.3 gave it 8, 13.9 gave it 6, 10. 6 gave it 9, 9.0 gave it 10, 5.1 gave it 5, 2.0 gave it 4, 0 0.9 gave it 3, 0 0.8 gave it 1, 0 0.5 gave it 2. So, by and large, very well received. The special effects tend to be quite good, as per usual, for James Cameron. Uh, the, um, you know, there's some really, really convincing, like, visual effects. There's some really solid uh, practical effects. Uh, you know, it's it's clear that they went practical whenever they could, whenever it was feasible, or practical, if you will. And yeah, uh, you know, there's there's a there's a weight to it. Like I, I already mentioned, you know, you have like cars driving fast, you have, like, helicopters, and, and, like, you know, in real life, you can make those things go fast, but if you're making a movie, you have to be very careful, and in some movies, you know, they're so careful that you end up, as a viewer, not really feeling like there's, you know, that, that there's a real, like, weight to it, and speed, and, and tension, and that's never a problem here, you know. And there's some really excellent stunts also. And, uh, yeah, some, some people don't feel that this movie is quite violent enough. Or at least not so violent that it deserves an R rating. I mean, certainly it isn't as, like, it's not a hard R when it comes to the, the violence. Um... Yeah, um, you know, if, if, yeah, if to you, James Cameron action movie is Terminator 1 or 2, or Aliens, this is not as violent and gory and, and like, really visually violent as, as those are. This you know, in this, it's almost more implied, like, there is some, you know, some people are shot to death, there is some blood, but it's not, like, really, like, vicious, the way that a lot of his other violence is. And, right, so there will be several links in the description box stuff that I encourage you to read and or watch depending on the link and I think I will go ahead and copy there we go so 
Yes, this, like I mentioned, I watched this on Disney+. Plus. There are no special features for it on Disney+, Plus, at least not here in Scandinavia. And the, uh, yeah, the suggested field has Commando, Predator 1, Die Hard 1, Big Trouble in Little China, Speed 1, Terminator Dark Fate, Romancing the Stone, and Jewel of the Nile. Yeah, the those make a lot of sense as as other stuff to to watch. That is, yeah. So the um, yeah, and you know it does the um. Let's see. They also Disney Plus, at least here in Scandinavia, does currently also have Titanic. And Avatar, and I believe it will eventually also have Avatar The Way of Water, but, you know, currently they're making money off that, in, you know, yeah, I just clicked it, it says exclusively in theaters now, but, yeah, eventually it will probably be there as well. And it is, you know, if you, it, they have a bunch of special food. Oh, okay, wow, I remembered it as being more, but there's like... Let's see real quick. I guess it's five. There's five behind the scenes specials on for Avatar on Disney Plus. Yeah, if if this movie did not have all the reactionary hate, this is a seven or maybe even an eight out of ten. But as it is. I can't, in good conscience, give it more than five fun, problematic spy missions out of ten. And, yeah, this is the part where I sometimes talk about, um, will, you know, will I watch it? I've, I mean, I, I wouldn't have watched it now if not to do, you know, to do this video, because I, I want to try to do a video on everything that James Cameron has written and or directed. There's very little left now that I have, you know, basically The Abyss and Strange Days are are it. So, I don't know, I guess if I at some point forget how problematic it is, I, you know, yeah. Right, I, I suppose, I should, you know, I'm not saying you're a bad person if you do like this. Um, I would ask that you try to investigate, like, I, I think we should analyze all media. You know, the stuff we love, the stuff we hate, but... Yeah, and, and and I will also acknowledge it is a movie that didn't seem as bad at the time. It, this is not the only misogynistic, it probably isn't even the most misogynistic, like, major action, ma major American movie of the 90s. There's almost definitely, yeah, yeah, there are, there are some that are, that are worse. But yeah, um... This is my lowest rated uh, James Cameron movie. This is, of, of all of his movies, this is, it's the only one I don't love, and it's the... Let's see. Yeah. Um, if you want to laugh about spies, watch Austin Powers 1 through 3, you know, or... At, at least one of those. If you're going to watch two and three, make sure you watch one first. If you want to laugh at American foreign policy in relation to international terrorism, watch Team America. If you want to watch Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime fighting an army of faceless bad guys who are not American, watch Commando. If you want a movie that's a great mix of action and romantic comedy, watch Mr. and Mrs. Smith and or Night and Day. If you want a better James Cameron movie... Yeah, James... Yeah, um... Yeah. If you want a if you want to watch a movie that James Cameron wrote and or directed that is better than this, you know, pick one at random. And that brings us to the spoiler sections. Throughout the rest of the video, I will be spoiling everything in the movie. So the rest of this this is when I get into the the thoughts section. It's just, it's not a review. It's a series of well thoughts. Some of it is analysis. Some of it is MSC through K riff tracks and other jokes. So the first section is you know yes um, 
notes taken while watching in chronological order. Think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And paper notes. So, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate that the first thing the movie, you know, the movie makes clear this is, there's a lot of security at the, the what's it called? This German, you know, yeah. It is very, you know, you need a, um, an invitation, and there's like security, they've got dog, you know, what was it Tom Arnold called it? Razor sharp pooches, or something like it. Just, yeah. I, I forget exactly his words, but they made me laugh. And, you know, yeah, we were sent back like, okay, I don't know how, how is, even Arnold Schwarzenegger, how is he going to get into this? And the camera goes under the water, and he cuts his way through the, the gate and gets up, you know, and wetsuit comes off, perfect suit underneath. Yeah, James Bond. Very, very nicely done. And I like that, you know, he, the, the way that he gets past a lot of people is that he pretends he belongs. You know, it's, it's basically like, you know, none of these, like, you know, he, he walks out of the kitchen and there's this, like, chef or, or you know, he's like, what, why did you just come out? You know, he, or he's, he's about to say, why did you just come out of the kitchen? What, what are you doing here? And Arnold walks up to the, the table and he's like, what is this food? Are you cra are are you cooking for your dog? Get rid of this immediately. And at that point, like the you know, is the chef gonna be like, first things first, why did you just come for the No, he's gonna be like, oh crap. I guess I just don't recognize him, but he must be working here. Because who would walk in who walks into someone else's place and starts yelling at the staff about the food that you know no, no, like, normal person would do that. So he has to assume that this guy belongs there, you know, so so that's a great... And, and he does that, like, three or four times. You know, he keeps walking up to, to people and, you know, just, yeah. And um, I can't help but... I don't mind the fact that the introduction to Faisal is a a joke i don't even particularly care that like you know the the joke is that he's like standing there urinating he is a, you know he has to get into the van before the you know i guess i just feel like did there need to be so many jokes about peeing because you have that then arnold says i have to take a huge leak like a minute after that happens simon wets his pants twice and, and then you have multiple jokes that are about, you know, is it rock-hard evidence? No, it's kind of limp. And they make jokes about size. It just... James Cameron, I respect you for most of your work, but I think you may, like... Wait, is this why he put a penis joke in Titanic as, as a, like... Is because because in that the the you know Rose is like so the reason the ship's so big. Um, have you read Freud? Maybe that's because of this anyway. And the let's see. Yeah. So the the um, I I appreciate the detail that you know, eventually it is noticed because there are all these patrols, so they're like, there's some, there's some, you know, somebody broke this, uh, somebody broke the ice. Do we have an Arnold Schwarzenegger? We have an Arnold Schwarzenegger, don't, don't we? Oh, crap, I really hope he cools it on the, oh, no, I'm, no, I'm doing it. I hope he takes it easy on the puns. But the, the, yeah, you know, the, um, Okay, I guess Mr. Freeze wouldn't be breaking ice, he'd be making ice, but still. The, you know, it's it's not just, like, randomly... No, they actually do... You know, they spot the, the hole in, in the ice, and of course, they're, you know, and have, they, they do the alarm thing. And... Let's see... Yeah, and I, I really like that, like, the, the detonator is, like, the cigarette case... 
you know, so the, the guy, the, the guard walks up to him, sir, I really need this orientation, I, I think he's, like, speaking German or something, you know, and, and Arnold is like, you know, oh, just calm down, I came out here just, my, he's not saying that, but that's, like, his body language, he's like, calm down, you know, gonna light a cigarette in front, and, and, you know, where's your invitation? Here, and he presses it, and it blows up, and it's, yeah, you know, hiding a, um, an explosive detonator in, like, a piece of everyday, you know, thing like that. Very James Bond. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and, Harry is such a bad husband, he actually forgot to get the ring back from Gibb. And he sighs before he enters, um, although there is a little bit of affection between him and Helen, which I do appreciate. As, you know. And Dana gets the gift, and just like the moment he's out of, you know, that he can't see or hear, she just throws in the trash. I... I guess I'm thinking of a different movie, but I remembered it as, like, the camera panning, and it's, like, the gift he gets her every time or something. It, it, you know, they specifically have her say, oh, I never got one of these before. I don't know, maybe it was cut out of my version, or maybe I'm thinking of a different movie, but, yeah, anyway. Then we have the, yeah, we see that, uh, you know, Harry doesn't listen to Helen, and I do, like, it's it's legitimately funny when she, you know, she's like, Ugh, he's asking for that much, what was it, like $600 or something like that. And, yeah, that's fine. No, it's not fine. It's extortion. And and then she's like, so I promised to sleep with him. You know, I slept with him, so he knocked $100 off. And Harry's just like, good thinking, honey. And, you know, just, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a pretty good test, that if, if he, yeah. And I, okay, so the vast majority of the things that Gibbs says about Dana are just completely out of bounds, completely unacceptable to, to say, even, like, joking, you know. But I did kind of like when he said, you know, he, she, she's putting on this helmet, and he's like, I remember the first time I got shot out of a cannon. I can't explain, it just, yeah, you know, I, I don't normally like Tom Arnold, but he is actually funny here, and it's especially the chemistry between him and, and Schwarzenegger, and, the, it, yeah, and, and the thing, you know, it, um, Harry realizes that Dana is stealing, and the, you know, Gibbs is like, you know, it, you know, you and Helen don't raise her anymore. Her parents are Axl Rose and Madonna. And, yeah, that's legitimately a good, like, I'm not going to claim that I was, when, when I was a teenager, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of my opinions were influenced by the, the music that I was listening to. So that's, yeah. Although, according to South Park, Axl Rose doesn't really exist. So, I don't know, maybe she's just imagining music that she's listening to. Let's see, and yeah, we see there's a lot of security to enter Omega, what is it, Omega Sector, I think, which is staffed exclusively by Omega males, but yeah, the, the brief bit, you know, you see, the, 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 good morning, Janice, and you know, you see her hand going under the table, and she readies the gun in case, you know, there's some kind of... Just and they they have to like I, f I forget what it is, um like eye identification so I you know some something that like scans and maybe also fingerprints I, f I forget but yeah you know you can't just walk in there without any and let's see. Um, I, oh, right, we're the, yeah, and the, um, yeah, it cuts from the car to Harry at the, at the office, 
of uh, of Juno. That was a great, you know, we see Schwarzenegger, he's like, okay, so I am Harry Ren, and then it cuts, Quist, and I'm looking for Juno Skinner, you know, just, yeah, and, and you know, he gives his credentials or something to get it, just, that was a, a great, yeah. Also, the, the cutting back and forth when, like, let's see, I think first you hear, yeah, interrogation, first you hear the distorted voice as Helen hears it, and then it cuts back, and you see Arnold's, yeah, I think it's like, um... I don't remember the question he asked, but he asks some question, you know, and then after we see her, it cuts to, to him, and we see him say, I said, and then it cuts to her, and, and we're hearing the distorted voice. Great little bit of, you know, it's not necessary to verbally tell the audience, this is going to distort the voice. No, you just cut from the normal voice to the distorted voice, and, and you know, because... It's a. It's part of the same sentence being said. We we accept that that's how it works. And I really really hate that Juno is basically there to be slapped. Let's see, twice by Aziz, twice by Helen, and that's yeah, that's big part of the reason the character is even there. Like. She she doesn't particularly yeah so you know but I will say the the scene is very tense when Aziz goes up you know Juno has to fake oh there these guys work for me you know she yells at them in Arabic and they you know start working and, you know normally and you know the reason they weren't hard at work is because she's not supposed to let anyone in you know so the the and, you know, she likes Harry, so she, you know, yeah, the, the, um, she does let him in, and, and, you know, Aziz, Miss, Miss Skinner, may I talk to you briefly, you know, and, and, like, and, you know, very, very, you know, um, like, what's it called? Like, he's, he's, um, he's, his body language is like he's beneath her, you know, and, closes the door, and the moment that the door is closed, you know, it gets much more tense. That was a, a good, you know, it's it's convincing as, think about it, they could easily have just, that could have been the first time we saw Aziz, but because we've just seen him with this, like, body language that says, oh, I'm so beneath everybody around me, you know, we buy, okay, yeah, he could sneak stuff past, yeah. And... Let's see. Yeah, the the I I mentioned in the review I really love when it cuts from you know Harry standing there like lighting a cigarette, and then it cuts to Aziz also smoking and like you know and the the camera in the in the cigarette um in the box of cigarettes which is also you know that was established at the at the house earlier, and we remember how it works because we see Dana stealing you know that's that it sticks with us. You know, some spy movies just show it, and then we kind of, you know, maybe we remember because it's kind of cool tech, but it doesn't hit us, you know. And the, yeah, the the fighting in the bathroom, very cool. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's a reason it helped inspire an action scene in one of the recent Mission Impossible movies. You know, it is legitimately a really really cool action scene and I quite like how it cuts to the old guy in one of the stalls you know and he's like uh, hey you know occupado come on guy you know, just and after the entire fight like Arnie like says sorry and he runs uh, you know and and the old guy like sticks his head out like what is happening and you know, then Aziz shows up, and he has plot armor too. So watch it, Harry. And Harry hears that Simon is on the phone, calling Helen, and he's really he's completely, you know, devastated. I do really love Gibbs' reaction. You know, he's like, "So what? What, what is it?" And and Helen is having an affair. Congratulations, buddy. Welcome to the club. Okay. 
I get you're you're a little too close to it, but if if this was happening to me, you would think this was hilarious, you know, and th this whole thing, and and just yeah, and and you know, Harry like hits the the window. Actually, that might be a later scene, but yeah, because he's so upset about you know, and he's like watching through binoculars, and he like crushes the you know the like the glass starts to break, and one of them from the tension and just yeah, and. Then we have the... Yeah, I, I really appreciate, like, for a while... Like, I guess, from when we hear that's... From when it's from when Simon is mentioned until we realize that he's not really a spy, it's not a huge amount of screen time, but the way the movie plays it, like, at first, you do think, like... You know, Gibbs... Gib, Gib points out, maybe he's using Helen to get to you. You know, it's, there's this whole, like... We're, we're thinking, and, and then, the, you know, I'm starting to like this guy. Uh, I mean, we still got to kill him, obviously, but, yeah, just, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and I do really, like, Simon is an asshole. Like, that, I, I have absolutely no empathy for for him. You know, I, I, like, I saw someone point out that, like, Helen is humiliated, by you know the the interrogation and being tricked into or, or being um what's it called being um ah what the hell's the word blackmailed into you know the the dance and you know harry is humiliated by being cuckolded and Simon is humiliated for, you know, he has to ad admit that he isn't masculine enough, basically. I, you know, I don't think that the humiliation Harry goes through is anywhere near as bad as what Helen goes through. I really empathize with Helen. I have no empathy for Simon. Like, you know, if you, if you recognize yourself in Simon, like, just don't try to get with someone who's married. Like, just period end of discussion you know go for someone and and you know don't lie to get sex uh, you know if if you if you currently aren't impressive enough that women want to to get with you improve yourself instead of coming up with lies that make you look better now the but but yeah you know i appreciate it like simon is clearly a, a complete asshole a real bastard you know he he lies to, to Helen to get her to sleep with him. And then, you know, when he sees Harry at the at the dealership, you know, like, they didn't have to play it to the hilt, but they do. You know, used car salesmen are these real bastards. You know, tricky dick, this kind of thing. So, you know, he, he sees Harry through the window and he's like, one born every minute. Now, in case you're not familiar, that... He's he's referring to the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute. He sees Harry as someone that he can take advantage of. You know, and he thinks that he's doing a really great job selling the car. You know, he sees Harry, and he's like, I bet this guy will love hearing about my conquest. Which, to be fair, if you just look at, if you don't know anything about Schwarzenegger, like, if you look at his face, his his massive body, you know, he looks like someone who would be fun. Like, in real life, there's more to him than that. But if you just saw him, you know, walk up to a used car, you know, yeah. you it, and, it's, and it is specifically the Corvette he walks up to. So, yeah, of course, Simon thinks this guy wants to get laid using a car. And he thinks that he's, like giving him gold, like, oh, you gotta, you gotta have a Corvette, but you also gotta have, uh, what was it, like, a, what did he say, a trick, uh, an angle, I think he said, you know, he thinks that what he's saying makes himself look extremely good, he thinks that Harry is like, oh, wow, this guy, I wish I could be you, you know, while at the same, while in reality, he's confessing to Harry, that is legitimately funny. That is a clever way to to do this scene. A again, think about it. You could easily have gone directly to 
Harry finding Helen and Simon in in the you know where Simon is trying to push her into them having sex you know but no instead we have this scene like it's completely clear like Simon feels no remorse for this you know like Harry basically he tries to prod him he's like what about the husband Nicholas, let's be honest if they were getting their work done if they were doing their job I'd be out of a job I love Bill Paxton. I really, you are missed, good sir. Just, yeah, so funny. Like he's he's so freaking good. He's just the the yeah, and 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 I really it one of one of my favorite parts. And it's part of it, you know, part of it is Schwarzenegger, but part of it is also Paxton. When Schwarzenegger like imagine like Harry imagines like I think he like uses his elbow on the on like the nose and like you know breaks the nose, like sends the nose bone flying into the brain and you know you just see Paxton you know blood pouring or not pouring out but a lot of blood on his face like completely dead it just and then it goes back and he's sitting there like ah just like. You gotta, if you have an ego, you're not gonna allow yourself to be filmed in, in such an embarrassing, like, position, you know. But honestly, like, I, Bill Paxton was probably like, let's go again, this was fun, you know. Let's see. And the... Yeah, I, I really appreciate the, the use of flashbacks in, in the, you know... Let's see. Yeah, you have the the. Um, yeah, you know the the stuff about like how did Helen meet Simon and the various uh, you know what 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 important call did she re did was received some something like that. And let's see. And yeah, uh, this is where I came up with. You know, I think. You know, one of the, one of the things Lindsay Ellis points out is that it's ridiculous how the the different plots of this movie are like, you know, what did she say? Glued together, like bol connected by balsa wood, some, something like that. You know, it's it's incredibly like. I think the movie would be better. Like, I get that if you removed the whole affair subplot, then you basically just have a funny James Bond movie. Then it's not really that interesting. But I don't think it makes a lot of sense to have, like, nuclear fallout, also his wife is cheating on him, I don't think they mesh together really well, and I think maybe, maybe if the movie had been like 90 minutes, and the thing with the affair was like the main thing, because you could easily see, not, not in editing, but rewriting this to be completely about the like you could draw out the mystery for longer maybe for uh, maybe for part of it it actually like may, may, yeah maybe more time is spent with Harry thinking Simon is actually a terrorist or something you know trying to get to Harry through Helen you know you you could open it with Harry completing actually yeah I, I don't know that you would necessarily have to change very much about the opening of the film you know, you could have the, the part with the, the skiing and all that, you know, leave that as is. Then he goes back, he pretty quickly finds out about Helen having an affair. Then we focus on the affair, and then, you know, maybe... Well, now, yeah, I guess... Um, no, it probably should... Maybe... Would, uh, would it make sense if maybe he usually is a spy, but there's like... You know, what was what that line in... Okay, I'm not going to claim that there's some... I don't love the movie Major Pain, but I do think it's pretty funny when very early on, you know, the, yeah, the basic concept is this hard military guy taking care of these kids. They're, the explanation for why is, you know, he's he asks, like, well, don't you need me to... You know, he asks the military people, don't, don't you need me to, to take care of the bad guys? And one of them is just like, you killed them all. You know, have have that. Like, yeah, have have the movie open with like a quick sequence of of Harry doing something incredible. Yeah, yeah. Like 
what's it called? I can't believe I'm blanking on the name because it's one of my favorite comedies of all time. Hot Fuzz, you know, open with like, oh, he's super cop and then, or super spy, and then, I don't know what to tell you, Harry, you, you stop them all, America has no enemies left, go home, be with your wife, you know, we'll call you if something comes up, something like that, and he goes home, his wife's not at home, and he, he realizes, oh, you know, the, the, she, she left for this or that, then, you know, finds out about Simon, and the movie is him, you know, yeah, tracking down Simon and finding this whole thing, and then, you know, I would say you shouldn't have her be humiliated, but, the um, yeah, and anyway, I, I don't think that it fits together very well, that, like, for, for chunks of the movie, and again, this is something Lindsay Ellis points out, so I'm, I'm trying not to restate everything she says, but just, she points out, like, basically, you have the terrorism, and then you have the affair thing, and, like, when one is going on, the other isn't. And it just feels very awkward how it goes between those sections. And... Yeah, you know, when Simon says, you know, we have to be convincing as intimate, you know, it'll it'll save lives, or we'll, we'll, we might die if we're not convincing as intimate. You know, he's a real bastard. But not very long after, Harry, you know, uh, also tries to trick her into intimacy. So just, yeah. And and you didn't have to have that. Like, you could so easily just have that Harry wouldn't even dream of that kind of thing. Just, yeah. Let's see. And, and it is brought up, you know, uh, Gibb tells... Harry, you're never there. You know, she's a woman. She She's a flesh and blood woman. She has needs. And let's see. I, I do really like Helen fighting back. Like, can we just, can we have more of the movie just be her? You know, and I, and I do appreciate that when one of the, the spy people, you know, like hits her with the, I think it's like the butt of a gun, you know, Harry attack, you know, smacks the, the spy. But yeah, I really like which like she let's see does she na nail one of them in the groin maybe and like Harry like grabs her and she bites his hand. I don't know. I mean Michael Bean isn't in the movie. It's it's you know James Cameron sure does like having female characters bite Michael Bean on the hand in his movie. So much so that even when Michael Bean wasn't in one of the movies, he still found someone to, to bite. Yeah. And, yeah, the, the flashbacks to meeting Simon, you know, when, when did you meet him? And we just see the, the you know, and, and the thing with, like, you know, she she opens the, the suitcase and oh, there's a gun and then she locks it and puts it, you know, that, that was legitimately funny. And, you know, the, the parody aspect kind of assumes that men and women are equal, which is, like, we should be, that would be great, but if you look at laws, if you look at history and culture, men and women are not treated as equals. And the, you know, the movie turning Helen into a sex object for both Simon, you know, Again, if it just, if that was the thing, if Simon trying to turn Helen into a sex object, if that was the bad thing, but no, the bad thing, apparently, is for someone to do that to a woman they're not married to. Just, because, because, Harry never has to, like, yeah, you know, Helen realizes it, but, like, they don't get divorced, she, yeah, she, like, she, she hits him in the face, once or twice, and she she castigates him for it a little bit, but that's all. Like, it's not at all equal to the, the you know, women have been legally considered property, especially of their fathers and husbands, for most of history. You know, the the the, the even the like marital rape used to be legal, so you can't just have a husband, you know, 
force her force his wife into sexualizing herself like this and say oh but it's equal because he thought she was cheating and she hits him in the face and she yells at him a little bit it's not the same it's just not if like historically if a man was cheating on his wife you know if he abandons his wife that's it she has nothing and she's not going to be able to marry anyone else because everyone knows she was married so no one's going to want her anymore you know if a man you know if a, if a woman cheats on a man first of all in a lot of cases it's because the man is abusing her second of all if she does leave the the man she's married to you know, she can't be sure that the new man is going to take care of her, and again, if, you know, if he gets rid of her, you know, whereas a man who's been married multiple times, he can still get a woman, uh, you know, so, yeah. Let's see, and, you know, I, they should just have had, like, mocking of rich people, you know, which, like, not for nothing, but Trading Places, Jamie Lee Curtis is also great in that. That's a comedy that is, like, brutal to rich people, but it's incredibly funny because rich people are assholes. Like, rich, like, it's obscene to be rich while people are starving to death on the street. And that was true in, I want to say it was 1983, Trading Places. It was true in 1994, it's true in 2023, so... You know, that would be a th and And that's also, uh, I just mentioned um, Hot Fuzz. I am not going to say who turns out to be the villain there, but there is a very clear target for satire. And, yeah, frankly, the, the you know, yeah, the people that movie is really brutal in, in making fun of are also people who can take it. They they have, you know, things are... are good enough for them that it's not but and that's just not and and again i realize i get this is not the only misogynist 90s movie now the let's see and yeah i really like when she almost breaks the glass in the interrogation room i i would have i like uh in my head can she smashes the glass she sees it's harry you know Knocks him unconscious. When he wakes up, they're divorced. But, uh, yeah, and, you know, she says, yes, I love Harry. I always have. And I will always love Harry. And that's when he picks her up and carries her out. And I think the end credits start rolling at that point, but I don't think I've ever actually watched that movie. I just, cultural osmosis, I know the scene. And, let's see, I, I... When, when, you know, when Harry and Gibbs, Gibb, I keep calling him Gibbs because I, for, for years I watched NCIS. I do realize they're different characters though, but yeah, Harry and Gibb have, you know, Simon, he's like, I haven't seen your faces. And they tell him, oh, uh, you know, which would also have been a funny time. I can't, is that why? Because there's a similar thing and it's like, no, he didn't see the face in another movie, um, but, but yeah, you know, and, oh, hey, it's you, do you still want that Corvette? He can't turn it off, he literally can't stop being a used car salesman for two seconds of his life, and they might be the last two seconds, like, just, that's, a, that's amazing, and I, I like when the, um, uh, let's see. The the yeah after the after the dance, you know, both Helen and Harry are saying to the other, "Let me handle it." When when Aziz's people are taking them, and yeah, you know the the every er, every terrorist in this movie has brown skin. The the voice is very clearly Middle Eastern. They're speaking Arabic. The there's a emphasis on their the the semitic hair and the like the the you know the the facial hair is is very distinctly middle eastern you know they're they're very distinctly othered 
let's see, and if not for the racism, I do think that the low battery gag would be a little funny, like he's trying to give this big monologue, he's, you know, it's this important speech for the world, and, you know, and at the end of the day, like, it is, you know, it's a combination of two things. It's him being so scary that his people don't dare speak up, and him wanting to have these threats filmed, you know, like, the fact that the battery is so low suggests that this is not the first video they've filmed, you know, so he's constantly like, okay, in character, and so, you know, he's constantly threatening the, the, you know, he's constantly yelling threats at this camera, and eventually the battery runs out, and the guy's like, oh my god, he's gonna kill me, he's gonna shoot me in the face, and, you know, he lowers the camera, and Aziz is like, what? Low battery, I'm sorry, don't kill me. You know, that, like, that's a well-constructed joke, that is legitimately a, you know, let's see. See. And I, I gotta say, the fact that they didn't check Harry and Helen at all, like, they knew that Harry was a spy. That's why they took him. And they didn't check if there was maybe a tracking device before they put him on the plane and flew. Like, they knocked him out. Why, why did you put him on the plane and knock him out if you weren't going to check him? Like, I could understand if, like, they couldn't get to a situation where they could check him before flying. But that's not, like, just... And they don't, they barely even get to the, the, the islands, the, the other guy, the other good guys, in time anyway, so it doesn't really matter if they knew, just, yeah. And, yeah, some good jokes with the, with the truth serum, uh, you know, Helen getting some answers out of Harry, and Harry t t talking the, the, t um, interrogator through what he's going to do. And, yeah, and, yeah, and it's also treated as this, oh, dangerous thing when the Muslims are firing their guns in the air, into the air, as if white conservative Americans don't fire their guns into the air to signify they're happy. You know, there's, like, conservative Americans and their guns, that's way, like, that's, you know, yeah, that I, I would I would be I would feel way safer around Muslims than white Americans, white conservative Americans, if we're talking like in America. Um, and and you know it's uh, I, I I'm not sure we knew it at the time, but it has now come out that at least since 9/11, a number of civilians have died because. American, you know, drones would target people firing guns into the air without thinking about the fact that some Muslims celebrate a wedding by firing guns into the air, which again, like, you know, that's just, that's a, that's a thing they did, like, like, should we, should we go down the list of all the stupid things we white people do to, to celebrate, like, you know, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with celebrating something with, firing a gun into the air, you know, so the, yeah, and let's see, and I think also, you know, the, if, if the movie was retooled so a woman was a really good spy and the guy wasn't, I think that could be funny, you know, but, oh, you know, hyper-masculine Arnold Schwarzenegger isn't good enough for her, so I guess he has to sexually humiliate her and, like, start to what appears to her is rape, like, which actually, yeah, is sex under false pretenses is rape, so, yeah, he, he starts to rape her, and we're supposed to think that he's the good guy, and I think it's also just, it's a bad idea to do a Bond parody without addressing racism and rape and, and, you know, also colonialism, actually, yeah, colonialism is also part of the problem, you know, if, if not for colonialism, America wouldn't be so hated. So, so yeah, you know, it, there's a... 
not that America itself has gone around colonizing the world the way that the British Empire did, but it has led to a very well-deserved reputation that if white people come to your country with guns, it's not because they, you know, the guns are not to protect them from animals. They're trying to take your land. They're trying to kill your people, enslave your people, you know. And, yeah, I already mentioned Tenet as a excellent, recent uh, James bond e thing. And that movie does acknowledge, you know, yeah, that movie is not a, a white guy fighting a bunch of lesser non-white people. There's no, you know, the no good guy rapes a woman, you know, so, yeah. Cause, cause that's the thing, like, and that might be, like, it's, I'm trying, I'm really trying to give the benefit of the doubt to all the people who say they love the movie, many of them even bringing up the, the, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis dancing in front of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and don't point out how messed up it is, like, you're allowed to like the movie, you're allowed to love the movie, but at least acknowledge how sick of a thing that is to do, like, and you, and, and you have young men wondering why don't women like me i don't know maybe stop being so happy about rape in movies maybe that would help maybe women don't like the the fact that cuz cuz you know a lot of women are like hyper aware and and look at you know when they meet a man they're they they have to be on high alert okay is this is this someone who might rape me or someone else you know, do I, yeah, so, a number of the, so, so, yeah, if you, if you approach a woman, and you're looking at her thinking, boy, I sure would like to marry her, and then trick her into doing a dance in front of me, and then almost rape her, yeah, that might put some women off, go figure, and the, let's see, yeah, when, when Helen beats up Juno, that's, basically the only time the movie lets her be cool. Well, that, and I suppose the, like, the tango, the, the bit at the very end where she's also a spy. And the married couple kiss, and there's a nuke going off in the background, and it's like, I mean, I guess we're supposed to believe Aziz when he said that it's uninhabited, even though there's a bridge that leads there, so, like, I mean, there's probably, even if not people, for sure, like some animals were just killed by a nuke. And I'm not saying that Harry could have prevented that, but maybe don't kiss right in front of it. And and, and again, like it is, it is this heightened, you know, it's it's only, it is like a parody of a uh, James Bond because. You know, James Bond movies will also have, like, an explosion, and then they're making out, you know, and, and, yeah. I don't know that there's a James Bond movie where there's a nuke, and then they make out right after. So, you know, it is, like, heightened, it's parody, but it's just in really bad taste. And, let's see. Yeah, we find out that F Faisal managed to get close to uh, Aziz and the and the terrorists because he can you know he he looks non-threatening so they think oh he's just a camera guy you know and he hid like a gun inside the camera which they didn't you know and it, it does make sense that they didn't find it what are they gonna do are they gonna take apart the camera again why does that work because Aziz loves being on camera and that's again like that's a quality joke right there i just wish it wasn't tied up with the racism because like at the same time like in reality muslims are not listened to very much in america so like there's probably a bunch of white people who sat and laughed ah, look at that muslim trying to be taken seriously you know so that's yeah Let's see, and and the Harry struggling with takeoff and and um, Gib commenting on it, that's legitimately that made me chuckle. That was the the let's see, um, let's see if I can really quick find. Um,
Hmm, maybe not. Nah, I guess not. But yeah, the the um, yeah, it was it was really really funny when like you know the the. Um, so, so, yeah, let's see. I th yeah, you know, first Harry gets in and, and Gibb is like, don't don't worry, he's, he's got this. He's flown, like, 25, you know, so, and then the struggle, and then Gibb is like, it has been a while, though, and then, you know, starts to do a little better, and you know what, this is actually, this is pretty normal. This is this is a Harry Tasker takeoff. Uh, you know, that, that was quite funny. And... Let's see. This was, yeah, at this point I thought of another idea. Maybe instead of an affair, the jokes could come from Super Spy having to deal with, like, normal domestic stuff. Like, maybe the neighbor is annoying, or there's a there's a celebration of a birthday or something, you know, that, you know, you, you could, you can make this stuff funny. You don't have to sexually humiliate the wife. And Dana steals the the key, which is also you know the the um, Dana sees that the key is but you know and we get a little I think there's like a focus pull and she's like looking at it and so we realize you know and then as he's like as soon as I pull that key and the you know the other guy who didn't get the memo you know he really like you gotta would have been great if if um. Faisal could have told him, Don't screw this up, you idiot! You know, but he's like, what key? And Aziz turns around, you know, and then he realizes it must have been Dana, because she's, she's the hostage, you know, everybody else there, uh, you know, there's, yeah, there's, there's Dana the hostage, there's the, the guy, um, I get interviewer or something, there's the cameraman, and everyone else is a terrorist. So, you know, and, yeah, she turned, she uses her powers for good instead of evil. Uh, you know, which, I get, yeah, just, like, James Cameron, at least in the 90s, had a thing. Like, if a kid is doing something bad, eventually they will use that to save the world. You know, so that was, yeah. Um, I mean, it shows some empathy for troubled children and like at the end of the day like it's not the end of the world if you're like it's not great if your kid is stealing but like you know try to try to have a conversation with them don't like kick them out of the house and yeah it actually shows that dana is a better spy than helen she shows more of an uh, uh natural affinity for it and I realize I'm jumping back slightly, but I gotta say, this viewing and the most, and, and the other most recent viewing, which I guess by now is like, maybe two years ago or so, it, it was, um, yeah, anyway. When, when we get to the bridge and Helen is just screaming like a maniac to get, like, you can have her be rescued without all the screaming. It's completely unnecessary to make her such a stereotype, you know. But, yeah, that was when I was really, really exhausted by the misogyny. And, and thankfully, you know, as soon as Helen is saved, there's not a lot of misogyny after that point. And, you know, Dana is hanging on for dear life. Help! Help! My ventriloquy will not save my life. And let's see. Uh, I am not entirely sure what that note is supposed to mean. Uh, oh, right, right, yeah. I like that, it, yes, now I know, um, when Aziz manages to, to get the gun back, like, for a second, I was like, okay, so he's gonna be stupid, and he's gonna shoot, try to shoot Harry, that wouldn't make any sense, because then he's gonna die. No, he aims the gun at Dana, and says, take me down, or I will shoot your daughter. You know, that's, that's thinking, and, you know, and, and Harry, like, I think, like, does he, like, maybe look, 
down to, or no, he like looks to the side and looks back at Dana, so she knows I'm gonna try to, you know, knock him off the, you know, and yeah, you know, I don't hate you're fired. I I do think it's it's kind of funny. Why was the terrorist helicopter just flying around doing nothing though? I don't know. I just I kind of forgot that there were even were flying terrorists at at that point. Like, why didn't they fly to try to attack the Harrier jet? Ah, anyway. And and also I just want to point out like one of the most like really aggressively racist when when the like when they when they managed to stop when when the terrorists managed to stop the car from going over but only barely and then like a seagull or something lands and that's too much weight and they fall in you know the the performances of the of the terrorist members there just cartoonish like completely ridiculous and yeah you know in in the entire movie every time we've seen them but that's one of the more like aggressive spots like Let's see. And also because it's not interrupted by, you know, gunfire or explosions or such. Uh, yeah, we jump to a year later, and now the family is closed. You know, they're playing... I, I gotta say, before I watched this movie, I did not realize it was possible for three people to play Thumb War at the same time. I've only ever seen two people do it, but maybe it is only done in this movie and nobody else, no, nowhere else. But yeah, you know, they're they're happy together, they're smiling, they're laughing. Just, yeah. And and I do really appreciate, you know, it's not like, oh, Harry yells at Dana. No, it's just, you know, he's he spends time with Dana and Helen and now they're happier together. You know, most pe most like there are some people who will try to abuse you, for sure, but a lot of like if you're you know, if you're in a romantic relationship, if you are, and if you, and or a parent, most romantic partners, and, ah, hold on, a lot of romantic partners, and try to, you know, try to get to know someone before you get too deep into a relationship with them, a lot of romantic partners, they just want you to show that you appreciate them, they just want some of your time, some of your physical affection, they want you to be there, you know, that's really, and, and I do really appreciate that, that Cameron realizes that, because there's a lot of movies where it would be, you know, yeah, a, a much worse, a much harsher ending. And, let's see, and, and Helen fits in as a spy, just like Harry did, you know, saying, oh, it's so nice to see you again, and, and various, you know, and they tango, and now she's really confident, which is cool to see, and it is kind of, like, the part where she, like, falls and stays on the floor, like, that is kind of funny, and it wasn't supposed to happen, and at first, uh, like, Curtis was, like, uh, you know, was angry at Cameron for leaving it in, and then she realized, no, that's actually, that's exactly what the character would do, and it is, like, it is kind of funny. It is the the let's see, you know you can't always plan for the thing that's going to be funniest. Final section: notes taken before watching. So I'm just gonna get to the top. Here we go. So, while I realize not everybody agrees, I do think it can be very useful to try to rewrite a movie to address the problems you have with it, to demonstrate to those listening to the review it didn't have to have those problems. And of course, I'm not going to claim that I'm the best writer in the world. You can have a conflict between Harry and Helen without it being so misogynistic. If she misses adventure, why not have it be that instead of, you know, it appearing like she's cheating on Harry, you know, and, and right, real quick, the thing I always say about cheating is, if you feel a very strong attraction to someone who isn't your partner, start by trying to process it, get past it, maybe using therapy. For some people, it helps for the person who's considering straying to talk to th with their partner. A lot of people do not realize that their partner is unhappy and are willing to make a stronger effort if it is made clear to them. If that doesn't work, if you simply cannot stop being attracted to someone that is not your partner, break up with your current partner, then go pursue that other person. Don't cheat on your partner. I've never heard a good argument for cheating. 
Helen, uh, let's see, yeah, instead of the cheating, maybe have Helen in secret be a thrill seeker, like she does rock climbing, maybe she's buying a motorcycle and Harry finds out she's spending money, he thinks, oh, she's spending it on a fair. A lot of men get really possessive of their romantic partners and extremely paranoid. Have that be what we're laughing at, instead of trying to get us to laugh at a powerless woman being, like, she literally thinks that she is taking off her clothes in front of a suspected arms dealer, and then he makes her think that she's, that he's going to rape her. Like, it's just, it's disgusting. And if you're going to put something like that in the movie, have it end with them. Hon honestly, yeah, tell you what, have the movie end with a divorce. Maybe he goes to jail. He never works as a spy again because clearly he's not responsible with what they, you know, he, he abuses the, the, you know, what the, the power he's given. And in fact, maybe have it be that because he abuses that, an attack does happen. Because, and he could have stopped it if he had been, you know, but no, instead, like, the terrorist just barge into the hotel room, and he has a chance to still stop them. And maybe instead of her almost ending up with someone who isn't a real spy, despite her being married to someone that she doesn't know is a spy, maybe she goes and actually does research and thinks she has an idea of how to stop a threat. Have her actually prove to Harry that she would actually be a really great fellow spy, especially if we're going to have... If you're going to have the movie end with her becoming a spy, as it is, it's fun, wish, wish fulfillment, sure, but is it really that satisfying? It's what I want, sure. I, like, I, are there movies where Jamie Lee Curtis plays a spy? If if so, I, I don't think I know them. Please put them in the comments. I, I would love to see that. It's, you know, and, and it feels like a very reasonable expectation for a James Cameron movie, but it doesn't feel like the movie's going in that direction at all until just arrives there. It would strengthen their marriage that he realizes he doesn't have to keep his work, his real work, a secret to her. They would feel more connected on account of working together towards the same goal rather than living these separate lives. Again, as the movie is, of course Helen wants Harry to succeed because that was the mainstream American opinion when it came to Americans fighting terrorism. Nothing in the movie seems to suggest she disagrees with that, but she does not herself seem any good at spycraft and it's played more as her being awful for almost cheating on Harry than her potentially being a great spy partner to him. The only reason that the movie chooses the striptease, which is apparently in the original French movie, there's a lot of French cinema that's amazing, but holy crap do they have issues when it comes to women, is how Harry gives Helen an adventure is because Harry and Cameron, the screenwriter, both want to sexually humiliate her some more. They're, it could have been a dozen things that did not do that to her. And as I already mentioned, him nearly being cuckolded is not the equivalent. You know, the movie could choose to only make the terrorist and the misogynistic Simon be evil men, but it actually makes up ends up making Harry and Cameron look terrible as well. Like, I don't want any of these men to end up with, uh, you know, Helen. I want her to end up, you know, taking... Yeah, have her take Dana away. Have her point out to him how, you know how awful he is for both of them. Now, let's see, the, um, yeah, you know, if, if you were to rewrite the movie as it already is, and just, you know, oh, she wants adventure, like, oh, actually, yeah, never mind, yeah, I have some other things I want to say before I get to that. So, yeah, some critic quotes, let's see, um, Yeah, one critic points out, you know, uh, subjects Helen to all kinds of traumatic situations. It's all supposed to be okay because it's absurd. Arnold misunderstood what's going on. I still feel bad. I wonder what the audience reaction would be if the genders were reversed. And let's see. Yeah, and, and one person that Curtis ends up getting roped into the big action climax to tie everything together, so obviously this was all necessary. You could do that without humiliating her. The comedy occasionally cross occasionally crosses the line into mean-spiritedness for its characters who suffer more pretty difficult to laugh at humiliation. And it's disturb it's frequently disturbing how Harry treats Helen. 
His behavior towards her in the first half of the film is frankly repugnant, vicious, and frightening, but it is often presented in a humorous manner. Wife's reaction to her husband's behavior are even more shocking, actions that would constitute grounds for divorce. For most persons, trouble her only briefly and actually seem to stimulate her, stimulate her sexually. I would have thought most women would be inclined to take out a restraining order against anyone who did even a fraction of what he does. And let's see... Yeah, and about the, the hotel strip tease, you know, in front of a man she doesn't realize is actually her husband. Roger Ebert called the sequence cruel and not funny, wallowing in humiliation and nastiness. And let's see. And, you know, Helen doesn't really get to have power in this situation. Harry exploiting the reality of the situation. And then this critic says, to try to heal his marriage. You are rationalizing. He is not doing it to heal the marriage. He's doing it because he gets off on it. I know. The movie itself clearly is under the... Uh, the movie thinks that he's doing it to heal the marriage. That's because it's in denial. It just... There is no way that he thinks that this is the way to heal the marriage. And again, I will... I have a rewrite that would make it so much better, which I will get into... I think pretty soon, but I have a bunch of notes. So let's see. Um, yeah, and this person says, you know, yes, it's, you know, the way Harry treats Helen is cruel, but it's not like Helen doesn't make Harry pay for his sins. She does smack him in the head with a phone, kick him in the gut, and punch him in the face. That's not even remotely enough to make up for it. When If he lost some teeth, then we can talk. Okay. That was a joke. That, obviously, I don't think that that would be... Uh, I stand by. Divorce. That would be... Uh, anyway. Sometimes I make edgy jokes. I can't... I try to keep it under control, but sometimes it just... I, I love edgy, ju edgy jokes. Anyway. So, let's see... Yeah, and this person says, oh, you know, they become equals. And... Right, so, some reviews claim the war on terror is a good thing, so it's clear that not everyone who loves the movie thinks that it's ridiculous in its depiction of Middle Eastern terrorism. Some think that it, you know, it, it's good that the movie is, you know... A bunch of reviews talk about how much they love the stripping scene and or include stills from it or of Curtis in the dress. And, you know, keep in mind, she ends up spending, like, maybe half of her screen time in that dress, and she only wore the dress in the first place because she thought that otherwise she would go to prison. You know, she didn't do it because she was thinking, oh, this is gonna really get my husband going. It's much rarer to see anyone talking about the badass stuff that the movie does occasionally allow her near the end. You know, which the people who bring it up often use to excuse the humiliation the movie put her through. You know, that's also, like, some people think it's hilarious that, like, she, when, you know, she fires the gun and is useless, but when she drops it, then magically, you know, so basically, like, women can't use guns, but guns on, like, a gun on its own is better than a woman holding it. Like, do you not realize how misogynist that is? Jesus so clearly a lot of people didn't particularly care about the badass stuff. I do think a bunch of the men who love the scene are just ignoring the gross context and are really just ogling her without believing that it's right to force a woman into something like that. And, you know, I've seen, like, the scene shows up in some, like, you know, top ten hottest this or that scene. Not all of them explain the context of it you know they just say this was a sexist scene in the movie so not everybody who loves the scene realizes how gross the context is let's see um or only criticize that the scene kind of comes out of nowhere defend that without addressing the following without acknowledging how misogynistic it is to blackmail a woman any but especially one you supposedly love like this is right right there okay you know what? She still loves him. She said so. There's no reason to d disbelieve that. I can't believe that he still loves her. Nobody who loves their partner would even think of something like that, much less go through with it. Like, he's just... 
It's so gross. It's so... Someone you supposedly love into doing a seductive dance for someone she thinks is a criminal mastermind. Something, some say the main reason Curtis, the talented actress, was cast was her sex appeal. I didn't see anyone saying that of Arnie, who is by, first, by far the worst actor of the two. Plenty of his roles he got because people like seeing him and stuff and are willing to accept the bad act. Like, I remember when he was, like, a really big deal. And, like, I remember, like, the late 90s and early 2000s, like, nobody thought he was a good actor, but everyone wanted to see and, and I'm not saying I'm above it, but I'm, like, it's so gross to try to, like, she's such a talented actress, and she does a really great performance here, and some people are still, ah, just because she's hot, and it just... Let's see, and... You know, tons of 80s and action, 80s and 90s action icons are bad actors, but they got a lot of roles because people like seeing them and stuff. I'm not saying it's all. I'm not saying it's true of Bruce Willis, but let's see. Yeah, and I saw there was at least one user review where he felt the need to assure the reader. Of course he likes ogling women, as if people would judge him if they thought he didn't. Well, some people would. What I mean is as if people whose opinions should matter would. And I am happy to report there are people who did point out in user reviews, like, like I said, it's very messed up. Now, um, did I? Uh, right, right. I yeah. I'm getting to the my rewrite of the striptease soon. I don't sell airplane parts. I never sold airplane parts. I mean computers. At the very start of the movie, when Schwarzenegger is on the run from the skiers, some of them very nearly hit him. He should sue them for a dollar. And Arnold does eventually reveal to his wife he is a secret agent man. When the couple are caught by the terrorists, they are moved a significant distance. Down by the Florida Keys, there's a place called Kokomo. That's where you want to go. And the ending sees the daughter become much more well-behaved. I really do appreciate James Cameron clearly his empathy for children when making movies. Basically, she was seen to act out earlier because her father didn't really show a lot of concern for her. And at the end, he proves beyond a shadow of a doubt he cares deeply about her. She wasn't a bad person. I mean, in my personal opinion, there are no bad people. There are evil ideas and actions, but this is a movie that thinks that there are evil people. She was just trying to get attention. If she couldn't get positive attention, she was going to try to get negative attention. I really appreciate the movie doesn't suggest that the solution would be to yell at her or send her to a private school or something. The solution is to empathize with her, to demonstrate that she is loved by her father as well as her mother. I don't think she ever really doubted that her mother loved her, which is why we don't, you know, we don't see Helen do something specific to prove it, and it's not really necessary. Now, um, there we go. I'm just going to make sure to... There. So, uh, right. According to IMDb Trivia, the striptease scene drew some criticism for its perceived misogynistic content. Cameron later said Curtis had heavy input in how the scene was played out. That's good, but he did still come up with it. Like, what, is she going to go to him and say, take out that scene? He had much more power in Hollywood at the time than she did. The original idea was for Helen to go completely nude, but in the dark, so that only her silhouette would be seen. It was Curtis's own suggestion to do it in full light while keeping her underwear on. Demonstrated it to Cameron beforehand, who remarked that he was reminded there what is so cool about his job. I hope he's talking about the collaboration and not the fact that an actress danced in front of him. He also noted most of the criticism of the scene came from men, while most of the female reviewers praised it as an empowering and even liberating scene for Helen. I tend to try to avoid criticizing women, except the rare unethical ones, especially when it comes to feminism. But I do think that the empowering, liberating aspects could have been accomplished without sexually humili humiliating and blackmailing her. I think that right after he finds her with Simon, instead of the whole interrogation thing, just have her, just have him say, you know, were you, were you with that guy? And she said, no, of course not. I love you. Then he could ask, you know, the, the... Let's see. 
Yeah, and and you know when she says I didn't have sex with him, and you know he could say I I get that you miss uh, you know you want to have an adventure, but we could have adventures together, and then like have him ask her what would be your wildest fantasy for us. Brief close up of her pondering, smash cut to the strip tease. You know you don't have to make it. Just yeah. I get it. I get that, you know, oh, standards were different. It's like how, you know, some people make the argument, I'm not going to come down on either side, I don't know enough to, but some people make the case that the the, the Christmas song, ah, crap, what was it called? Um, uh, uh, Baby, It's Cold Outside. Some people say that the song is not about non-consensual sex, it's about how a woman can only consent if she starts by seeming like she's, you know, not consenting. And given when it was written, I think maybe that's true, but I'm not going to claim that it for sure is. And certainly, anyone who thinks that the song is gross, you are 100%. Like, honestly, I'm not comfortable with the song as is, but yeah. Maybe, maybe that is how it, you know, but by 1994, you could have a woman saying to her husband, I would like to do a sexy dance in front of you. You don't have to have him blackmailing and sexually humiliating her. Just, anyway. Uh, yes, and more IMDb trivia. In January 2018, Eliza Dushku, playing Dana Tasker, who played Dana Tasker in this, revealed that when she was a 12-year-old child actress making this movie, she was sexually molested by the film's 36-year-old stunt coordinator, Joel Kramer. Dushku detailed how Kramer groomed her for several months to gain her friendship and her parents' trust, contrived to spend an evening alone with her, and then molested her. Dushku also said that after an adult friend confronted him on the set about the abuse, she was injured during a stunt. Dushku alleges this was no small coincidence. To be clear, over the course of these months, rehearsing and filming True Lies, it was Joel Kramer who was responsible for my safety on a film that at the time broke new ground for action films. On a daily basis, he rigged wires and harnesses on my 12-year-old body. My life was literally in his hands. He hung me in the open air from a tower crane atop an office tower 25 plus stories high, whereas he was supposed to be my protector, he was my abuser. And after her statement, Dushku's co-stars Arnie, Jimmy Lee Curtis, Tom Arnold, and James Cameron all tweeted their respect and admiration for her bravery. And I do really appreciate that. You know, there's a, sadly, an, a lot of men who won't stand with women when they come forward with things like this. And it does also make it's so much creepier when Gib is talking about, you know, her hormones are going off like a car alarm. It, you know, is she having sex? Maybe the money is for an abortion, you know. To be clear, I'm not saying that James Cameron writing and directing those lines and Tom Arnold delivering them knew that she was being molested. But it's already a really gross thing to joke about. And that was a problem during the 80s and 90s. This is far from the only case, or the worst one, but that doesn't excuse this. They could have chosen to buck the trend. Now, let's see... Yeah, right. Uh, um, more IMDb trivia. The reason that Helen slides onto the ground, they had rehearsed the tango so much that her legs were tired, gave out on her during the take, so she struggled to get back up, and uh, yeah, you know, initially she was angry that Cameron kept it in, but then realized it was totally what the character of Helen would have done. And Simon and Harry are mirror images of each other. Simon is a salesman pretending to be a spy. Harry is a spy pretending to be a salesman. Now, let's see. Right, some Wikipedia. Um, so, the, yeah. The film received criticism for its portrayal of Middle Easterners and its treatment of female characters. And, yeah, the... the the hero character using his agency's resources to stalk and, stalk and frighten his wife is cruel and misogynistic. Taken individually, the cruder and childish things about this film, its determination to use caricatured, unshaven Arabs as terrorists, the pleasure it takes in continually mortifying a Weasley used car salesman in the most personal ways might be overlooked, but added together they leave a sour taste. And... Let's 
see. Uh, the film, it's a strange case of film that's alternately retrograde for looking and thoroughly of its time for better or worse. It's a marker of how the Hollywood blockbuster had advanced in 1994, as well as commentary, intended or not, on the troubled state of American masculinity, marital relationships, and lingering racial attitudes. And write some more critic quotes. Um, let's see. Not only were these acts of invasion of privacy and stalking not romantic, the acts of trauma that he put this woman through was not really that funny. It's just wrong many different levels. I'm surprised that his wife was willing to take him back after all this without divorcing him or pressing for criminal charges. Add the fact that he's doing all this during a time where national security was in high alert, with terrorists publicly threatening American lives with a dirty bomb. He risks a lot of American lives for very selfish reasons. How in the hell was he even going to explain all the wasted assets to his boss, Spencer Trilby, in the end? I'm deeply surprised that the hero didn't get fired or face serious criminal consequences for this abuse of taxpayer dollars. Honestly, all these parts of the film is kind of realistic. Let's see. The middle part was so unrelated to what happens at the beginning of the film to the point that I nearly forgot about the terrorist plot. There, Yeah, that's... And that's not, like, James Cameron usually, like, yeah, that's very unusual for James Cameron. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and this, this review, okay, so this person says, depending on your political viewpoint, you could say that Curtis does get a little, and he even put exploited in quotes, there are people who wouldn't say that. Like, I get that there are people who would say she deserves it, but there are people who wouldn't think that it's exploit. Jesus fucking Christ. And then he says, here and there, she spends most of her screen time being mocked. It's just not always equally aggressive. And, yeah, then he's, you know, for a director who's become well-known for his portrayal of strong women, Ripley, Sarah Connor, this could be seen as a step backwards could be seen, because when conservative ideology takes over your brain, even basic language gets mangled beyond recognition. Dude, just say it doesn't bother me, though. Don't pretend you can't recognize it. Could be seen as a step back. And then he said, if you can bring yourself to forgive this little social blooper, social blooper, that's an interesting way to spell sexual trauma, Let's see. And and then he says, it's not quite family friendly enough to be enjoyed by the whole family due to its bad language and violence, so the sexual exploitation is fine for the whole family. And his one complaint is that Arnold doesn't say I'll be back anywhere. That that's a problem, not the misogyny and racism. And let's see. Yeah, and, and one, one person says the reason it was rated R is because of the strip tease. She takes her clothes off, the scene is erotic, but it's also romantic. Come on, people, Sade is playing in the background. For any woman who finds it appealing, that's great. I'm glad it worked for you. But any single guy who gets off on imagining such a non-consensual situation, get help. Let's see. And... Yeah, one one person said they smuggled the nuclear warheads inside of ancient Middle Eastern an ancient Middle Eastern artifact. That's like a disres disrespectful slap to the face towards history and culture, and it can also lead to people being suspicious of Middle Eastern art. And let's see. Right, and and um. One person said, I can't unsee that I saw Malcolm in the Middle's mom in a bikini. And, like, that's a, that's a different actress. Like, I'll, I'll grant that there's maybe some, like, there's some resemblance, but, yeah. And, let's see...
Right, and and there's this one guy who got really, really angry that people were criticizing in 2019. Let's see. Because of um, the the you know, there's a scene in in the 2019 movie Captain Marvel where you know the the uh, the um, you know the the movie the scene yeah parts of the movie take place in 1994 and there's like a standee for this movie in in a blockbuster and it's shot now let's see yeah this guy got very angry that people really yeah and he, he you know he ends it by saying stop trying to be offended by things that came out 24 years ago and grow up I mean you're really offended that people are offended by something that came out 24 years ago like I if you're gonna yell at people being offended like like I'm not claiming that I wasn't offended by this movie you know but apparently this guy like it's offensive to him that people are criticizing a movie, but, like, just, like, I think we should be critical of all media. Right, and and one, critic, one user review said, apparently one Arab good guy does not balance off one Arab bad guy in the eyes of some. There's dozens of Arab bad guys. There's just only one that has lines. Like, seriously, there's there's... Like if I had to guess, I think Arnold shoots at least a couple dozen, maybe, maybe two dozen. You know, or not not all of them shoot, but he manages to kill at least a couple dozen. And the va yeah, almost all of, almost all the Arabs in this movie are bad, and there's no like, the movie doesn't actually consider if they're if what they're saying makes some sense. It doesn't. Tr the movie doesn't make us empathize with them. And, right, one user review said, in the intervening years, Dushku became a bigger star because of Buffy, True Calling, Dollhouse, all while usually playing the tough chick. A movie made in the 2000s, a, a sequel to this, would have had her in her 20s. What if Harry and Helen found out about their daughter, now out on her own, was also actually also a secret agent without them knowing about it? And let's see. Right, and he points out, you know, she has... To, Though she's only 12, she has the guts to try to keep the bomb from going off. Imagine 10 to 15 years later. Say she now gets in trouble and Harry and Helen have to go out on a mission to rescue her. It gives people some of the fun of the storyline of the original while also giving any number of fresh directions that could go in. So this guy loves the idea of a sequel that puts more focus on an underutilized female character. Like, if she didn't... If she wasn't part of the action climax at the end, I think some people would forget that Dana was in this movie. The most interesting thing this guy can think of for her is to get captured so she has to be rescued by other people. So no agency, she'd be a victim. Some people just have no other ideas for how female characters can be used in fiction. Personally, if I would say if they're going to take any steps in that direction, I think it would be better if Harry got caught and then Dana and Helen had to rescue him. But I think it would be even better if the three of them teamed up for a mission and we see that they work together perfectly as a unit after years of working together. Like... Uh, yes, this reference is vague enough that some some people will understand and it won't spoil anything for others. What I'm talking about is Spy Mommy, Spy Daddy, and Spy Girl teaming up. But honestly, I don't blame, you know, like, I, I would not blame Dushku if she would not want to work on something connected to this because of the molestation. Which, again, I don't blame James Cameron for. Only the the guy who did it. And let's see. Right, it was this. So, yeah. Um, so, one more critic. Central to the premise of the film is the eventual entanglement of Harry's wife, Helen, in the film's spy plot. Just as the healing of the marriage... 
Um, something else resolves the plot of that film. True Lies makes the revelations of Harry's real job and the synthesis of the domestic and globe-trotting double lives that Harry lives essential to the very structure of the film. Comedically, this reintegration of this relationship is achieved in classic screwball style from misunderstandings, false identities, and a back and forth banter. Narratively, the balance between the two leads is what resolves the conflict on the interpersonal level. And yeah, that is it for this video. So let me know what is your favorite spy movie? What is your favorite funny spy movie? And let's see. yes, so if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. I've, uh, let's see. yes, I've done vlogs on almost everything that James Cameron has written and or directed and uh, let's see I oh I didn't put yeah I there will be there will be a link to the playlist that links to some of it and then you know from those you kinda have to go off in other links cuz James Cameron has done a lot of franchise stuff so the playlist is gonna be completely unwieldy if I put everything that has to do with his alien entries or his Terminator entries in in one list. Now there should be a link to my main channel page, one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus live action Star Wars show, which these days is The Mandalorian, and I've done. You know, I've I've vlogged about almost everything that I have experience with within Star Wars. A couple of games, mostly movies, and a you know, little bit in the way of shows. So, yeah, if you want to hear what I have to say about those, there is a playlist specifically for my Star Wars Star Wars content. Recently reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my own next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And I swear I'm not this angry in every single video, but holy crap, James Cameron. I really ho hope you got therapy after this.